It's time for Twit This Week in Tech. We have a panel for you. The sparks will fly. Christina Warren and Greg Farrow. And we're going to fight over everything today. The Surface event's coming October 2nd. Does Windows still suck? Greg thinks so. Christina works at Microsoft. We'll also talk about the Apple event September 10th. Why telcos are the worst. And about the real virus that might be attacking Black Hat attendees. It's all coming up next on Twit. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Twit This Week in Tech, episode 734, recorded Sunday, September 1st, 2019. Forking Windows. This Week in Tech is brought to you by IT Pro TV. IT Pro TV provides IT training that's effective and entertaining with access to virtual labs and practice tests. Visit go.itpro.tv slash twit for an additional 30% off for the lifetime of your active subscription. Don't forget to use the code TWIT30 at checkout. And by Captera. Find the right tools to make an informed software decision for your business. Visit Captera's free website at captera.com slash twit. And by LastPass, a personal password manager and identity solution for businesses all in one. You only need one master password and LastPass will remember the rest. Visit lastpass.com slash twit to learn more. And by FreshBooks, the number one accounting software in the cloud for self-employed professionals and their teams. You'll make confident business decisions with FreshBooks. Try it free for 30 days at freshbooks.com slash twit. It's time for Twit This Week in Tech, the show where we talk about the week's tech news. Sometimes we have a show where we know that the hosts, the co-hosts, the people who join us on the show have such strong opinions are so engaged that we really need only a couple of them. And this is one of those shows. I am always thrilled to have these two on with me. Uh, Christina Warren, film girl, senior cloud advocate at Microsoft. Just the greatest. Hello, Christina. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I am so glad to see you. You're off your travels for the day, for the week, the month. Yes, a little bit. I will be in Portland just doing some personal travel uh, next week, but uh, I don't have any international travel until November. So I'm, nice. I'm, uh, I'm, I've been enjoying basically like the summer off. I, I did so much kind of around the world stuff the first half of the year that it's been nice to, to kind of be, you know, um, at home, even though uh, summer, which is now over Labor Day, uh, but it's been nice to not have to go anywhere, to be honest. You will see Christina at a lot of Microsoft events all over the world. Um, and she'll be back, I guess, in uh, November going all over the place. So it's great to have you on. Also, from the UK, speaking all over the world, joining us from the Packet Pushers Network, our friend Greg Farrow. Hello, Greg. Hello, Leo. Hello, Christina. Nice to see you both. Nice to see you. Haven't had Ethereal Mind on in some time, so it's about time. Yeah, it's been six months or so. Uh, yeah. But, you know, we've all been busy doing our thing, haven't we? You know, We have. Your Packet yeah. Pushers Network is a great place to go if people are interested in hardcore uh, enterprise network computing, uh, really a great place yes. to get that information. Mm -hmm. In fact, really, yeah, we're having a lot of fun. It's really going on long really well. It's been going so well, I, I, I kind of can't believe it, really. I should just do enterprise stories today, you guys. <laughs> I should just, <laughs> should focused on .NET. Actually, Microsoft yeah. is going to have a big event October 2nd. Do you go uh, to New York City for that or no? I'm not going to be there for that one, but I will be watching and like listening, you know, unwrapped like everybody else do, um, do you it, don't uh, i should just get this out of the way if you knew anything you couldn't tell us but if you, i knew anything i couldn't tell you but i genuinely don't you know probably anything. don't because this is the surface division most likely yeah right? this is the service division i don't know anything about this to be honest usually what happens is if i'm trying to find out what's what's going on i ask my friends in the tech press because <laughs> <laughs> because i'm not gonna like like the internal people aren't gonna tell me um uh, which which is completely fair so no i'm i'm as uh I'm, I'm just like anybody else watching from afar but i'm certainly excited because i'm a big fan of the the Surface devices. I, I got my husband um, a Surface Go last year. I and love my Surface I Go. I would love to yeah. see it a little more juice in it, but it's such a great mm -hmm. little portable tablet. It's about the size of an iPad, but it's runs in Windows 10, and it's just, I love it. That's my uh, it's go -to. great little portable machine. Yeah, yeah. No, I would like one a little more powerful too, and I would really love to see um, Surface laptops with a Thunderbolt 3. That would be like my kind of wish for. Well, for you, 
Windows laptop. You so. may get your wish. There are kind of some rumors that that may be something we'll see October 2nd. The other thing people are expecting is a device that was shown around Microsoft a few months ago during internal meetings, codenamed Centaurus, a dual screen laptop tablet hybrid. I won't ask you, Christina, but I'll ask mm -hmm. Greg. What do you? What yes, do you, please what ask you, Greg. Yeah, what do you, <laughs> she's suddenly silent. What do you think? I genuinely have no idea. No idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure. I, I think that I think the challenge here is, can, as somebody who's been using a desktop and a laptop for 20 plus years, and um, I've sort of been, I'm still very bitter about Microsoft. After 20 years of using the rubbish products like Microsoft Office and Microsoft Windows, I just don't believe that Microsoft will ever get these products right, and they should all just be thrown in the bin, and we should walk away and hope that something new emerges that actually works. We have a dissenting view. <laughs> <laughs> Somewhat I think dissenting Microsoft, view. I, you know, 20 years of Microsoft rubbish, It's they've clearly never gotten new. the No, you know, right. it's interesting. The hardware, this kind of hardware anyway, is new. I mean, they've made mice and keyboards before. They made a famously a, 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 a DOS card for an Apple II. But this is uh, laptop computing and desktop computing. That's kind of new for Microsoft. Uh, yeah, well, I guess I guess the thing here is that Microsoft's bringing the bundle together. Apple sort of proved the idea that if you make the yeah, hardware right. and the software, and then your absolute and the trick here is that Microsoft is now responsible for actually making it work. They can't blame the computer maker or the BIOS. They have to take responsibility for it. And then so what we're actually seeing, in my opinion, is Microsoft has to grow up and make these products actually work instead of just ship some trash I, that, no, I that never I don't think they're trash, but I do feel like Microsoft. See, I want to give them a pass because they're new to this business, particularly the Surface Book, the first Surface Book, which I had a lot of trouble with for six months, and I think it was because it had a detachable screen that was had a GPU. Hmm. that was detachable which was kind of problematic for the operating system i felt like these were kind of newbie mistakes and i do feel yeah. like the surfaces have gotten better we had a yeah, surface studio like, for a long is, time this is a hundred a billion dollar company that's had 30 years of experience of doing everything wrong they never get it right and yet we always sit there and say oh we'll give them a, give another them a go pass. but yeah, no wait a, a minute no, like no, if wait you bought a, a car that was as faulty as microsoft <laughs> windows is you'd set the bloody thing on fire and send it back right but there's no evidence that Microsoft they're, they're in the Windows... Carson, help me. I'm in trouble. They are, help me, Carson. They are, they, they are starting to ignore the things they're bad at and pay much more attention to the things that they are really, really good at, like enterprise software. There you go. Cloud software. There you they go. They are really, really good at Which the is enterprise. Exact, so, much so you've just made my case. Other company. <laughs> they are, they my are not so good at personal computing. Don't you think that they made a great computing. pivot, though, that Microsoft did a very good pivot? And, and they, they are, in fact, just, no longer really the Windows company or even the yeah. Office company. Look how many yeah. times, They're the how cloud many times company. they mentioned Windows in the past. Azure is in pretty past, strong. few big... Uh, conferences. Keep and they're a hell of a Linux company. Well, I, I, mean, I guess the, the point, I, I agree with yeah. Carsten here, right? The point, my point would be is that Microsoft's consumer division, which makes Windows and Surfaces, is just, as far as I'm concerned, a waste of time. And you should just, I, I would much rather see something else emerge to take up that space that actually works and hasn't got 25 years of baggage behind it. Like, you know, as we've seen the Android and iOS actually make products which work fundamentally reliably, and yet Microsoft Surface or Microsoft Windows 10 is demonstrably incompetent by comparison. So it's hard for me to get excited about a Surface thing, Emmy Jiggy, that Microsoft's consumer division would pat out. I think that you're right about Microsoft Azure. I'm very excited about Azure. I think they've done some good work there to make these product that product actually work. But it's pretty hard not to because they're on the hook for the whole thing. There's nowhere for them to shift blame to. So it's a different product market and a different business focus. The good news about the Windows ecosystem is, you. I mean, for instance, I've replaced the Surface Studio, which I had here, with a Lenovo, which is about half the price and I think in many respects a better piece of hardware. I like it a lot. This is the... Um, and again, Christina, you can recuse yourself. This is the invitation. We spent a long time on Windows Weekly trying to figure out exactly what this uh, Tron-like, these Tron-like <laughs> traces are. It looks like it's a fragmentary version of the Windows logo. Yeah, I mean, it kind of looks like the original Windows logo. Um, there was actually a really cool, I thought, kind of tie-in with uh, uh, Stranger Things um, season three. They oh. they did like a Windows 1.0 like release in the in the Microsoft Store, which was kind of cool. Wasn't that tie -in. fun? Yeah, I loved. That. I thought that was really fun, and so it kind of looks like the, the the Windows logo, the Microsoft logo. Obviously, I don't know anything about this. I don't want to comment. Um, uh, I, I'm happy to hear everyone else speculate to see what they think it might be. But yeah, I mean, it, it looks like 
you know, trying to kind of draw lines between they, things. They're, um, um, they're taking a page from Apple's playbook. Apple always sends out famously obscure invitations to their events and then yeah. gets two weeks of solid press of people sp speculating about <laughs> oh, what yeah. Apple's going to announce because of this. We, we're oh, pretty we sure they're going to do a two-screen system. I don't know if that's what we're seeing here or... I don't know. I don't know. The one thing I will say, and 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 I don't want to be the the resident Microsoft shill here because that's not my role here. But I do want to just stick up a little bit for. I'm not gonna. I don't work on Windows. I work on Azure. So thank you for the kind things you say about our cloud. But I actually have. Um, I hadn't used uh, as a day to day kind of device or, or anything Windows um, for quite some time until I, I joined Microsoft, and I still primarily use Mac OS. But I really do think that the the Surface line of hardware is is quite good, and that's. All I'm going to say, I'm not saying it's perfect, but I've actually, I have a Surface Book as one of my work She gave her husband a Surface Go I, for crying out loud. I did. <laughs> Either you don't like your husband or you think the Surface Go is pretty good. Well, 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 well I, bought, I bought it and I tested it out. I wanted to see, oh, how good is this? And then I gave it to him because he actually, he he broke his MacBook. And I was like, I'm not buying you a new MacBook. Wait like, a minute. You gave your husband a Windows machine instead of another MacBook? <sighs> he spilled stuff on it. and Oh, I'm so this was his punishment. <laughs> the Surface is his well, punishment. I, I mean, I was, well, it's funny. He's actually, he's been a hardcore, I switched him to Mac when we first started dating and now he's gone full on like uh, Windows again, but he loves that Surface Go and it's, it's a really nice little machine. You know, it's, I it's, think it's uh, cute as hell. I love I, it. I, I wish you were a little more powerful, but I think in terms of something that, that that's that small and that you can do, you know, almost everything with. Now, so good. another say, thing that we may hear at this Surface event is a new, stripped down version of windows we're expecting them to announce it at some point in the near future um, now this is really interesting because this comes back to my argument where if microsoft took away all the stuff from 20 years ago you might have an operating system that's actually secure and securable <laughs> and modern and runs at speed and doesn't waste battery and power just pointlessly so so if this happens, then I'll actually be quite interested. But at that point, Microsoft isn't innovating. It's just copying what other people have done, which is to say, if you're going to build a modern networking, a modern computing device, start by throwing everything away and building from the ground up. Windows well, Lite is supposedly that, for this dual screen display. Mm -hmm. um, go ahead. I'm sorry. The hard thing so what about... I was going to say, yeah, the hard thing about kind of starting over, because I, I understand like, you know, when you... Mm -hmm when you have like 20 years of legacy, and this is true whether you're looking at like like Mac OS or, or, or Windows or, or even Linux to certain degrees, is that you have like legacy you know systems that you have to do. Like I know, for instance, for the Windows terminal, which they are in the process of, of rebuilding right now, and it's actually really awesome. And it's going to be modular and you can get it from the Microsoft store. And, and it's just in, in, in kind of previews right now, but it's really, really awesome. I was talking to that team at Build and, you know, they'd wanted to kind of replace some of that stuff for a long time. And the issue was, is that if they made changes to some of the code, then certain machines that run like, like oil reserve, like, like pipelines would potentially crash. This, this has historically been Microsoft's problem, which is that right. they have had to keep legacy hardware and programs working. And they've right. always done a very no, good job of that. No, they haven't had to. They've wanted to. Well, you but, could make but a choice. I don't know if you're running an oil right? rig and all of a sudden your Windows is going to, you know. I was going to say, so like you fork the operating systems. system and you have Windows Legacy and you have the new Windows, which is what you're talking about now. There's going to be a fork. I, and I agree. Like I agree. Old Windows, Apple, insecure. Linux. Spend these have had an advantage over Microsoft because they yeah. haven't been in a dominant operating system, and so Apple has been completely. Uh, sanguine about saying sorry uh your uh your five-year-old machine's not going to work with the new operating system that's right. life well, but, but microsoft's getting well, a, but microsoft's but already but getting exactly heat for windows 7 today. not working in january that's more than but, 10 years old and people are already seven what saying what are you breaking windows 7 for so microsoft yeah. is in a different position and that's because they're dominant I but think. it just but it just it never it it made a it made a business decision to never fork Microsoft Windows. It should have gone like, here's Windows Legacy. It's developed. It's got all the problems of Windows Legacy. It's awful. It's unsafe. It's insecure. You have to run virus and malware scanning, and you have to have scheduled backups. It's going to be not resistant to malware. But over here is new Windows, and we want you to start moving to that. And let's start 
forking the two and going down the path. And, and Microsoft never this made that successfully. Decision. They have with NT with, with their with but, to, in their in their in the in their corner. They have done this successfully but once before. They split off and made Windows NT. Yeah. That turned into Windows 2000. And, and Microsoft actually, I think, is still uh, PTSD from, from that. Yeah. Because they had two tracks of Windows. And that were mutually incompatible, and it was a nightmare for the company. And they eventually re-merged them by choosing NT. It wasn't a nightmare. It was a natural industry progression. Uh, well, it's I think they the no, no. I think that they did not like the fact that they had the Windows 98 track and the Windows NT track. Mm -hmm. yeah. That was yes. a problem for them, and I think they decided to resolve that problem by making NT. I the think victor. that Microsoft internally wasn't competent enough to make the decisions. That part of it wanted to stay with, part of it couldn't make the decision to go forward. Well, historically, Microsoft, they had to go through. Yeah. They had to go through ME to do that. They had to. <laughs> their consumer, their consumer oh, force had to utterly ME, fail. No, no the, the, honestly, this fail is historically the problem with. Microsoft, which is you had these, and it's, many companies get in a situation where you have these little fiefdoms, and you had the Office group, and you have the Windows 98 group, or ME group, and they had the NT group, and they all sniped at each other. Nobody, you know, mm. the, the, yeah. the the power that the Office group had for a long time was to keep the Windows group from changing Windows too much because it would break off, right. things like that. And yeah. that is a, that's a, that's and a that's structural, institutional, that is it's an institutional competence. issue. And a lot, it's but it's not at all uncommon. It's a very common it's, problem. It's very common. It's, but let's call it what it is. It's institutional incompetence. It's, it's poor management. It's dysfunction. Yeah. Yeah. And it's perfectly natural. It's perfectly normal. All big companies are stupid. All but, big companies but, are inherently Let's give credit to Satya Nadella because he came in a little more than five mm -hmm. years ago. And he fixed, I yep. think he fixed that problem. I don't know, Christina, you work there. Uh, but my sense is... <laughs> I, I, wouldn't, I, I wouldn't work there if he was not the CEO. I think that's like, right. Yeah. If Balmer was honestly. still there, it wouldn't be a good company. I don't know if... Yeah. Well, he fixed it by just saying... Windows doesn't matter, so stop fussing about it. Let's go over here. Yeah, well, let's he go was and right. do Azure, right? He and was that's right. where the future is. He was right. And 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 the and the people who were running the Windows and the Office team and who were all going, wow, 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 my problems are bigger than your problems, just got told to shut up and get on with it. And lo and behold, the problem got solved. This so is what I, I mean. I Institutional think, incompetence is is normal, right? I'll be watching. I think we'll all be watching with interest on October second because if Microsoft does announce Windows Lite, and I think there's a yep. very good chance they will. This is an opportunity for them to answer your specific critique, Greg, mm -hmm. and yeah. say, we're going to, this is the fork you were looking for. That's right. In the same way that Apple proved that iOS needed to be completely different from Mac OS, one for this, one for that. And they've been able to run the two, and now they're merging them back together. I know. Which is, you know, but <laughs> notwithstanding, they're doing it fairly progressively. You know, we're going to go through a thunking. Remember the old thunking, the old Win32 yeah. thunk layer? Yeah. We're going to see something, you know, Win16 thunking. We're going to see that and um, and that sort of thing. But I, I do believe that Microsoft needs to bite the bullet and bring its customers into 2015, you know, and stop letting them run around and pretend that 2005 is still here in 2019 and say, you need to start iterating. You need to let go. And they've been doing it, right? You look at what happened, you know, they've taken, what is it, Windows 2000 is end of life. Windows, uh, one of the big Windows releases goes end of life seven. in January. That's seven. Yeah. Seven. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I don't, I don't. I'll tell you the big problem. The week. big problem I have is Windows 10 1803 goes end of life in December. That's a very recent, that's from 2018. <laughs> and um, there are a lot of people who can't upgrade to 1809, 1903, or the H2 version that's coming out. Because their hardware, for one reason or another, won't support it. I talked to somebody the other day who, on the radio show, said, yeah, I have an HP computer. Uh, it's 10 years old. Now, maybe it's time to buy a new computer. But yeah. he said, I, I can't go past 1803 because HP is not updating the BIOS. Microsoft tells me I need an updated BIOS uh, to go to 1809. I'm going to be out of support in hmm. two months. And yeah. Yeah, but I feel for the guy. It's a t I know you. I know what you're going to say, Carson. Yeah, but it's a ten year old computer. Yeah, I mean, I have a I have a wonderful iPad uh, iPad that still works. But yeah, that's the thing. If it but, still works, it, why it won't support? It's not going to support. Right. It's not like a car iOS, with a hundred thousand miles it on it. It works any perfectly. Any iOS that has not been put out of life. By, right. By, I was going to say Apple. you can't. Apple has put gonna, Apple puts stuff out of life much faster, much faster. Okay, let, let Christina say, talk. Like, I, I was going to just say, like the one point I will make on that is that, and you know, I primarily am an Apple user, but I can't think of uh, in mark like I can't actually think of it of a, of a 2009 era Mac product that will be able to run Catalina. No, that's right. Um, that's and right. and so 
I, th- I think that at a certain point, like I totally empathize and I, and I feel like it, it sucks, especially when it's something that seems like it could be easily solvable, like a BIOS issue, why you can't go from one version of Windows 10 to another. Like there are going to be these edge cases, but when you're at a certain point, like you have to have a cutoff somewhere, right? So it's almost like we're having this, we're having two parallel conversations. On the one hand, we're saying you have to push people forward. And then on the other hand, you're saying, but when you push people forward, people are going to say, but wait a minute, I can't use my old stuff, you know? So there, there's like, if you, if, if you want to move things forward, then at a certain point, you have to maybe say, okay, even if your stuff is still working, the downside is you're not going to be able to run the latest version of Mac I OS. Guess. Or you're not gonna- Although you can get a version of Linux that will be modern, up to date, and secure that'll run on that old HP I mean, just fine. Uh, for right now, I mean the the interesting thing there though is that you know with all the some of the big distros dropping 32-bit support, you'll obviously be able to find some Linux distro that will still be there. But I mean there was the whole thing with the Ubuntu dropping. Mm-hmm. 32-bit binaries, they've backtracked on that because Steam um, pitched a fit and the community right. was, right. were, 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 were going to revolt. But Canonical was going to do that with the very next version of, of Ubuntu coming out in October. And it's a lot of the, the Linux packages are, are not optimized for 32-bit and aren't going to be. There's also a big, you know, uh, Python um, end of life happening, 2.7 to Python 2 is, is going end of life um, at the end of the year. And that's going to impact a bunch of older packages too. So even though Linux is the thing that everybody always goes to, and yes, you'll be able to find specialized distros, I'm sure that will always be optimized well for older hardware. If you're looking at even the mainline Linux distros, you know, you're looking at Ubuntu, you're looking at Fedora, you're looking at Red Hat, whatever. Yeah, but there's a difference. Uh, Those are distros created by companies, just like Microsoft, and the distros that are kept up to date are are not by companies, but they're by enthusiasts, and they say, well, "Well, I want my old hardware to continue to run, so I'm going to make sure it does. So, so, so let's follow the money on this, right? If you follow the money. You you tell them throw out that old computer, it, but that's, that's right. not but necessarily if you're, bad. But if you're Joe user, do you know to go to a certain Debian based distro and get something, or are you going to you know try to get something that's tried and true and it's going to tell you this doesn't work? Yeah. You know, so at a certain so, point, like obviously, if you have the if you know what you're doing, you can find a way to repurpose your hardware. But whether yeah. it's, it's it's Microsoft or Apple or the major yeah, Linux, but for distros, normal people, normal people aren't going to go and find do the things that you talk about. Like well, that's nerd, why I'm on a fine. crusade to tell normal people, yep. don't throw it out. You can put Linux mm-hmm. on it. I'm on a crusade to tell them that because <laughs> yeah. that stuff's perfectly good. It's not, it yep. doesn't. It's and then, so, so let's go back to why Microsoft hasn't abandoned Win32. And the answer is they don't want to give a competitor a chance to enter the market because if they force customers like they are saying to customers now, your 10-year-old computer is no good, there's a pretty good chance that they'll just throw the computer out and go and buy an Apple iPhone or an Android and then Microsoft in the consumer division has lost that customer going forward. And we've seen plenty of evidence of that as the, you know, the window, the I desktop don't think market that's, shrinks. Honestly, don't think market. that's the motivation. Because I don't it think is, Microsoft absolutely. cares. Mo- no, no, you're wrong. Yeah. Microsoft doesn't care about Windows at all anymore. The motivation, now, no. it, the motivation is just as Christina said. There's a nuclear power plant in Belarus that's running with 32 bit <laughs> software, and and honestly, my, I think Microsoft is a, is being a good corporate citizen. They're just saying, They're look, I understand a- you got to have 32 bit. We're going to keep yep. supporting it, even though it's a security nightmare. And I think they're not doing that for economic reasons. I don't think there is a good economic reason for that. No, but we need to get those companies who aren't to to um, who are sitting there saying, I can't move off Windows 2000 or Windows 95 or whatever it is, right? And they have to bite the bullet and be pushed. They're not going to – if they can keep going back to people like you and me and saying we can't upgrade because wah, 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 they don't. They just sit there and put and, – and as long as it's working, it's fine. And that's the problem and because some, we have an insecure right? internet with all these people running Windows 98. <laughs> you can't, you're never going to get rid of, uh, you know, Melissa. Yeah. <laughs> the and so, you know, it's not like these people – Float around forever. And it's not like these people don't know this isn't coming, right? No. It's It's – We've been telling them for 10 years, you can't keep doing this. And guess what they've done? Nada. So, the, okay, well, I mean, we, so I we think We had it's, the same conversation 20 years ago with, with Y2K, right? I mean, but you still have people who maintain COBOL systems to this day. You still have mainframe systems. I mean, this is, I, I don't disagree that this is a problem, but this has been a problem that's been around for, I mean, at least 20 years now that we've been having this conversation where, you know, older infrastructure, people will not upgrade and will not pay for the, the price to... Um, you know, build to, to, to rebuild um, as long as it's working, um, that they will have to be pushed, prodded, and, and, and you know, threatened 
you know, with, with some sort of catastrophic thing to... It's, you it's know, Microsoft's not the only company having an event. We're going to take a break, and then we can parse the Apple invitation and see what it, <laughs> what it means. Uh, get some tea leaves. Now, out. folks, you know I what I was talking about when I started the show and saying, all we need is two... That may even be too many. Greg, Greg Farrow of the Packet Pushers Network, Christina Warren uh, from Microsoft, who can definitely hold her own. When uh, Karsten said, uh, we've got Christina and Greg, I said, stop. That's perfect. <laughs> That's perfect. Say no more. Say no more. Our show today brought to you by our friends at IT Pro TV. We've been with IT Pro TV since they first started. Uh, Tim and Donna were great friends. In fact, I had lunch with them last week when I was in Orlando. Uh, were trainers. They trained people to get the certs they needed to get the IT jobs they wanted. But they were doing it in a classroom environment. They came to an NAB presentation I was part of talking about what we're doing at Twit streaming. And they said, you know, this would be a great way to do IT training. And IT Pro TV was born. They now have over 4,000 hours of on-demand IT training. They're the official video training partner for CompTIA. In fact, they have 12 CompTIA on-demand courses. These are the most hotly demanded certs like A+, Network+, and Security+. Uh, they are amazing. They are teaching so many people. Thousands of people now have gone through IT Pro TV and got a great job. Most of those people stay with IT Pro TV because it's not now just for getting the certs. It's for keeping your chops up so you can continue to become a better and better IT professional. You know, there's some stuff that IT Pro TV now is doing that I, we've never mentioned before, but I want to let you know about. They can help, if you want to do training videos, they can help you in your organization make your own videos. They have an amazing studio they built in Gainesville with robotic cameras, HD video, DMX lighting, dimmable LED lighting. They've got an overhead talkback monitor. You know, the voice of God. We don't even have the voice of God. I always wanted the voice of God. A direct live streaming system. You could pick from multiple HD studios, bring your own host, or use one of their great, personable, smart hosts. So from planning to post-production, if you want to make for your organization training videos, IT Pro TV is a great company to check out. So I just want to throw in one more little thing they do. Whether you're new to the IT field or a seasoned pro, IT Pro TV's online IT training can change your life. The standard membership, which is just all the video, or a premium membership, which is the video plus labs and practice tests, are super affordable, especially when you use our offer code TWIT30 at checkout because you'll get 30% off your IT Pro TV subscription for life as long as you stay active 30 percent off and that's one of the reasons nobody ever leaves it pro tv visit go.itpro.tv slash twit the offer code again twit 30 and don't forget you can visit them at go.itpro.tv slash twit and uh, and have them help you make your own training videos too in any area it pro tv build or expand your it career and enjoy the journey i know so many people so many of our audience members who watch the shows and say, I love IT, I want to be in IT, who've gone to IT Pro TV and are now working in great jobs. Thank you, IT Pro TV. Go.itpro.tv slash twit. Promo code is twit30. Apple sent out the invitations on Thursday. Lori Gill on Tuesday during Mac Break Wheelie, she said, I predict. <laughs> I don't know if she knew, <laughs> she knew something or something. She said, I predict Thursday. So... That's uh, that's it. It's a week from Tuesday. It's September 10th. Yep. That's kind of what we thought. It'll be, of course, at mm -hmm. the Steve Jobs Theater in Apple Park. This is the invitation. It's a kind of a beautiful glass apple with all the colors. They've gone back to the colors, haven't they? The rainbow. Yeah, it's interesting though, right? Because uh, it's it's slightly different. Like they don't have the full six colors. Like I, I do like having the purple in there, but uh, yeah. It's, oh, that's, uh, it, boy, see, it's, it's why you talk to somebody like Christina. <laughs> I didn't even notice. No, I, I, There's I only five this. colors. Like, You're right. Yeah, no, I was looking at that. I was like, ooh, I was like, where's the orange? And and I was kind of looking at this stuff. I was like, oh, that's interesting that they have purple there. You see what I mean? Um, Talk about Kremlinology. <laughs> <laughs> and then it says yeah. by innovation only instead of invitation <laughs> only. That's just a pun. I don't know if you can read into that. Still. Are you going, Christina? Do you still get uh, those no. invites? No. No. <laughs> No, I do not get those invites. I wish I would love to go. Um, that would be amazing. But no, I, I I do not get those invites. Ironically, I will be in San Francisco or not San Francisco, San Jose on the 11th, but I will not be there on the 10th. <sighs> I know. You could probably change I'm, I'm, your flight. 
I know. I could, well, too, I don't see that it's too crazy. It's one of those things already. Like Tim I, I'm Apple. going in and going out. Tim mm -hmm. Apple, oh, she still I loves you. Um, I, I do. I, I love Apple. Um, I obviously, you know, love Microsoft, but I'll, uh, Apple always has a, has a very uh, soft spot, um, spot in my heart. And obviously I'll be watching um, from the Microsoft offices, probably with the, uh, with the um, Office for Mac team, which is what I usually do. I usually well, watch fun. the Apple yeah. with the, some people from the, um, the Office for Mac team. Uh, we watch like WWDC and the other big uh, announcements. There are not um, a lot of question marks. Yeah. As usual, once they get to manufacturing these new phones, the leaks from China come fast and furious. Uh, it's expected there'll be three new phones, the successors to the low-priced 10R, the medium-sized 10S, the giant 10S Max. Will they be the 11R, 11 and 11 Max? I don't know. Somebody's uh, Lately, they've been saying the 11 Pro, and it yeah, does make I sense because you've got Mac iPad Pros and you've got MacBook Pros, so that Pro line kind of would fit in. They've never done that with the iPhone. I, I'm not. I'm less interested in the iPhone per se, as I don't think there's going to be a a, a jump. Like it's hard to imagine that there's no. a technology shift like Nobody's there was doing for jumps the anymore. five to six. Oh, yeah. yeah, and the six to the eight, there was a substantial jump. It, you know, if it gets half a millimeter thinner. I'd actually be rather happier if they put a bigger battery Me in it, too. sort of thing. You know, like and that's why I so, love this uh, this Note 10 Plus. They put a 4300 milliamp uh, battery uh, hour battery in that. Yeah, no, yeah. I'd love a bigger battery. Um, I would like to see some things maybe with the the camera to take on the Pixel. Um, I think you're uh, going to see that, Christina. I do think you're going to see yeah. that because the, this is now the the real battleground is no longer phone screen, fingerprint, touch ID. The battleground is camera. Uh, yeah. They are going to do what Samsung did a couple of generations ago uh, at Huawei also. They're going to put three lenses in. Uh, I love it on my uh, Samsung phones where I have a telephoto lens, a, a, a normal lens, and a wide-angle lens. That's nice. Apple is rumored not to be quite doing that. They're going to use the three lenses uh, to do more computational stuff. Yeah, yeah, that's what they've that's what they've always done with the two um, lenses is is to try to kind of you know create that right. that that effect. Right. Um, I mean, you could obviously switch between one or the other, but you know they they try to use them all together. Um, no, that'll be interesting. Although I, what I'm hoping is if they do have the three lenses, that they will allow the APIs to be used by you know certain camera apps. Um, yeah, I uh, love Focus, for instance, which yeah, allows me to uh, use that. Yeah, I, li I like that a lot too. And um, uh, but that would be nice if they have those features so that you could isolate them if if you wanted to, you know, right. um, if you're mm -hmm. using the the right tools. But but I think that they like to err on the side of simplicity and really just make it so that oh, we're going to give you the most perfect photo. Yeah, the focus camera does some of the things the Pixel uh, does F O C O S uh, by taking multiple images and stacking them and. And yeah, and and Halid is is a really really good camera same, app. Same guy, um, right? Uh, yes, yeah. yes, and and uh, um, uh, Ben and Sebastian, and um, uh, yeah, I would love to see what they could do with really with amazing. the third yeah. camera. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and of course you're going to see in... a Pixel Four a month later, and it seems to be that Google keeps leapfrogging the camera capabilities of Apple. Mm. <laughs> with yeah, you know, right after Apple announces all these new features, Google says, well. well Mm. Well, because because Google is so much further ahead with the AI stuff, right? right? Like I think that when it comes to the hardware, Apple has has historically, you know, they've been able to source the best sensors from Sony and and do really good stuff. And for a really long time, they also had the best software. They were able to really um, write the the software to make those sensors just do amazing things. Where you could have the exact same sensor in a in a you know Samsung phone and an iPhone, and the iPhone would give you better results. But Google, because they are so much further ahead with the AI stuff, you know, they are doing some. Really really incredible things on the software side that it's, I think that honestly, this is one of those areas where Apple's commitment to, commitment to privacy hurts them because they don't use their user data the same way because they have this, this both public and kind of internal kind of policy about how they're using this information. They don't have all those data points where they can build models to do things like, okay, we're going to light up, you know, um, darker images and, and, and expose them so that you, so it looks like you've got, you know, full light um, uh, like the Pixel can and, and to do, you know, even things like, a, you know, portrait mode and, and whatnot. Like if you compare the, the AI portrait mode on the um, uh, iPhone XR and, and on the Pixel, there's no comparison. The, the Pixel's significantly mm -hmm. better. And I think it's because Google 
because they have so much so many more data points and because they're not opposed to using those while they're building their software, they're at a big advantage. And so I'm interested to see what Apple's able to do on that front. I, I don't doubt that they have the engineering talent to do amazing things, but I do wonder, it's like, you know, Google does have this this huge treasure trove of, you know, you know, billions of, of data points from users who've been using I think you know, that's, Android I think and that's other overstated. I don't think, I think that Google's much touted AI thing, that's not as a competitive edge as people think. Really? I think it's, yeah, no, I think it's much more about getting the software right down on the camera and the control of the sensor. But Apple's been very conservative about the sensors that it buys and Google's been um, much more willing to throw more resources. But the Pixel 3 had a dedicated the, AI chip yeah. for photo imaging. Yeah, but yeah. correspondingly, the Pixel 3 is weaker in a number of other areas. It's the rounding right. out of no, it. No, I agree Apple with you. Balances, <laughs> ba Apple balances the photo. Like, focusing on the photo capability ignores dozens of other features no, of the phone that are just... No, that's a good point. The Pixel 3, right? for a so, long time, cr closed out programs overly aggressively. There's all sorts of software yeah. issues. Poor memory management, yeah. rubbish battery life. It's yeah. open to malware. It's about as the most one of the most vulnerable smartphones in the market. Well, you know, the list goes on and well, on. Every phone's so, open to malware. We have a story a little later on yeah. about Apple and malware yeah. we'll get to. But So my point would be don't over-rotate on just taking photos because that's one of 400 features yeah, in a, a good smartphone point. that well you taken. want. I, I would be much more looking for wireless charging. I'm very tired of lightning cables, super tired. Well, Apple has um, wireless charging now. Uh, no, you know, they the already watch. have it. X, the 10s. Oh, yeah. The, yeah. And now what about the watch? The watch is um, wireless, but you have to have a special yeah. puck. And remember, yeah. Apple so, tried to make the air power and couldn't, so got a but Mophie and others have done it. Yeah, yeah. I would like to see the, the 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 sort of the promise that we got with the wireless charging out of the last event actually come out. So Apple ships its wireless charger using oh, an open air power is dead. Get with yeah. it, yeah, Greg. Dead, yeah. dead. They already said we're not going to make it. We, we can't. No, we know that. I'm aware of that. What I'm ago. saying is the commitment was they they. They're coming with wireless charging, but you know, a couple of models of phone isn't the whole range. Why isn't the can't don't just have a a charging pad that all my devices go on? I I'm expecting to see new AirPods. I think Apple's making a big commitment to wearables. Yeah. I think they see that everybody's going to buy a phone. It really doesn't matter what they ship; they'll make good money Supposedly out of it. Supposedly, a new watch will also be announced. I I expect their way of growing their business is to get more services, but also to grow adjacent markets to their smartphones. Accessories. I think Apple's. Yeah. Yeah. So watches, AirPods, and iCloud, you know, the cloud services and so forth. But So I would expect at this event to see growth in watches and AirPods and other accessories, heart, uh, health accessories. So you don't think that Apple has a disadvantage because of its stated privacy policy compared to Google and even Facebook and Amazon where these no, companies are happy to no. gather all the information about you they can? Doesn't that help them with their, with at least with their voice assistant? I don't believe so. I think you you can hear the story that Google pushes and you think that it's correct. But when you go and talk to people who do um, DLMLAI, they'll actually tell you that once the models are trained, you don't need lakes of data. The data lakes aren't actually all that relevant and you can send it down. So you don't need... Yeah, you know, Google even got, said that at Google I.O. They said, you know, we're going right. to take these mm -hmm. trained uh, sets and we're going to compress them way down and you're having it all on the phone. And, of course, that's what Apple's wanted to do for a long time, which is exactly. well, right. all that's what on phone. But whether you've got but one petabyte or 10 point. petabytes or 100 petabytes of images doesn't matter. The same model's yeah, but result. getting that okay? initial data is I the problem. I was going to say getting to that initial model because, I mean, the thing is, is that, look, Apple has finally started to publish things in AI journals, which is great. But Google, you know, with TensorFlow, I mean, I, 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 you, I, I, I don't think it's, it's arguable. Like, I think it's actually completely inarguable that Google is very far ahead when it comes to AI as compared to Apple just all out. You no, know what I mean? No, from, from I'm, not, I'm not making yeah. that statement. What the statement that I'm making is whether you've got a one petabyte data lake or a hundred petabyte data lake doesn't necessarily improve the models. Right? I don't disagree be. with that. My, my point be. is I don't think the model. models uh, on iPhone are anywhere near as good as the models on Google. Anybody I, I who used Siri, has used Siri knows that. Anybody who's used Apple Photos, I do. Well, Look, Siri, I use Siri's Photos. a different. Siri is about five years behind Google's Voice, well, so it just doesn't have and time it in the development cycle. Earlier. Well, but it started and, five years earlier, and it actually started ten years earlier because it started as a as a DARPA project. I mean, it, it, it goes way back. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, yes, they, they bought Siri. Siri. Siri wasn't an Apple. They, they uh, bought Siri in 2011, yeah. and and you know, um, and, and Google Assistant came out later, and and, and Google might have been doing some voice stuff, but they certainly it, it wasn't as if they were years ahead of Apple. But I mean, even just looking in terms well, of like your your. Da- your data models, though, so look at Google Photos. I don't use this, but most iPhone users I know do. Um, look at Apple Photos. Some of the big features with iOS 13, and, and I joked about this like in June, it was like, oh, finally, you know, Apple Photos is going to be getting, you know, the uh, some of the same features that Google Photos has literally had for years. But if you've ever, but I, I know even without using, you know, the final version of iOS 13, it's not going to be as good as Google Photos. Now, I just personally don't like, I, I don't, I feel yeah. weird trusting all my photos to Google. But again, but I, I don't care about Google Photos better. as much as I care about a better calendar app or a better Hey Siri or a better HomeKit or I a better be. I, I'm a user. I'm just I, saying that, that when you're looking at the models, if you're making that kind of argument, I don't disagree that that at a I, certain point it doesn't matter how big the, the size is. I think is, Apple I think focuses on the ninety ten rule and if ninety percent of the people take a photo and that looks good, we're done. Yes. We just don't exactly need right. to keep you're exactly Nobody right. cares. Yeah. Quite honestly, I don't care. I can take my phone out. I can take a photo and it's perfectly good enough. I don't, all these things that you're talking about make no sense to me whatsoever because I take a photo for my personal menu memories. I do not expect to pull out Halide and start adjusting the focus and the white balance. All I want to do is take a photo of my daughter I think you're at dinner true. and I'm done. Right? Although I that's kind of what Google has done with a single lens yeah. on the Pixel 3 is you take the picture and it's a great picture. That's that's, I think, that's what they're I going for. Yeah. yeah, but that's what Google does so well. Whether you go with so well. or a half a dozen, whether there's little goblins pop out and go and take the photo no, but, for you and but do whatever. I, I don't care. That. What I want to yeah. see is wireless charging. Apple's problem, which is, I still believe Apple has a problem between this desire for privacy and this ability to make Siri better. And they just two days ago put out a press release uh, talking about changes they're going to make in the way Siri gathers data. Uh, they even say in this in this section here how data makes siri better they talk about the thing they got in trouble for grading which is having humans listen to the requests um and they said that there's a value but as a result of people's privacy concerns we realize we haven't been fully living up to our high ideals ideals and for that we apologize so they're not going to by default retain audio anymore Users will have to opt in to help Siri improve. I think that's going to hurt them because most people are not going to opt in. And when customers opt in, it will no longer be contract workers listening. It'll be only Apple employees. That's going to cost Apple, but of course, Apple has plenty of uh, money. So I think Apple, yeah. um, I think Apple is caught. I think Apple put that big sign right. up at CES saying, "What happens in your iPhone stays in your iPhone." They got caught by the Guardian because it wasn't true. Uh, Credit to Apple, they're going to or improve admit, Siri's I privacy think, protections, I think, but I think that's going to hurt them. I, I don't think it will because I, I don't think anybody gives a hoot, right? And I don't think I most do. I don't use using... Siri because I'm tired of Siri saying, "Let me tell, show you what I found on the web for that." Yeah. That's, and I, I want to make an appointment. Alexa, for... or they're not using Google Voice either. It's a feature that no one uses, mostly because they're in alpha. These voice agents are so well, early let me in ask, the cycle. I Christina, mean, do you use a voice assistant ever? Yeah, I mean, I was gonna say. I like, use it all the I, time. Yeah, I, I, and and what's what's actually funnier to me is that the not I probably it's like the more technical people that I know probably use them less. I see less technical people using Google assistants and using That's Amazon. That's true. Devices. My in-laws, they will say, "Allow Aloysius exactly. play Elvis." <laughs> yeah, my mom uses her Aloysius all the time. Um, I have, you know, other relatives who have kind of a combination of Google Homes or, or um, you know, Amazon devices. I'll and tell you another data point that is an actual data point. Five uh, percent of our listeners listen on voice-activated devices, Google Home or, or that's uh, a big, that's, Echo. That's, a that's big huge. Percentage. That's a five percent increase in well, podcast so here's listening. A, here's a data point. We in our audience, the number is zero. Well, you've got a uh, different audience. That's actually know, what Christina you know, was just saying. The more, because kind of you have a more technical know. audience. Yeah, I was going to say more technical, but and it's actually what's interesting too is when I see kids all the time interacting with them, like very, very actively, and and it's that's interesting to me in the same way that touch. You know, we very quickly kind of starting with the iPhone have um, there's been this whole generation that's been this touch first generation where you see it where they they touch every screen whether it's a TV screen or a computer monitor or whatever they just expect to interact with it that way um, I don't think we're quite there with voice but I'm starting to see more and more you know kids of especially younger kids who just immediately 
instinctively know to, to start talking to their devices. And I would use Siri more if it were better, right? Like I use it to set alarms and I use it, uh, that's basically kind of what I, and, and sometimes to play music, but I wish I could use it for more things. I just haven't been able to rely on it in so long. Uh, whereas I do use, you know, my my Amazon devices um, for, you know, to, to here's to some grab, here's you know, some more stats. This was from uh, the podcast movement uh, we were at a couple of weeks ago. Edison Research interviewed two different groups of podcast listeners, longtime listeners. They call them veterans and newer listeners. They call them rookies of the veterans. Seven percent listen to podcasts most on a smart speaker of the rookies. Nine percent. It's a larger number. Uh, and I honestly, in fact, uh, I think what you're really seeing here is fewer of the new listeners listen on computers yep and and more and more phones and smart devices and so i think voice i honestly think voice is i think greg you're an outlier yeah my wife <laughs> my 12 year old my grandparents they have all switched to listening to only music on using a voice assistant my 12 year old mm -hmm. does all of his web searching through a voice assistant. That's bog that mind boggles. Yeah. Like, that bo just, yeah, because there's no link to never, click afterwards. I guess just, you just want just the fact. He just asks his phone to, to yeah. look something up instead of typing it. Yeah, that's interesting. It saves him a lot of time. Yeah, so it's uh, really so conditioning. Never, I do have to push back. I have to push back on Greg against his wireless charging accusations because every single product that Apple has shipped since they made the, the, the wireless including charging Including the products, new AirPods. Including the new AirPods. Mm -hmm. Including the watch. Including the iPhone, they all wireless the wireless yep. charge. Everything with the, the iPad. watch doesn't charge. Do very people well want wireless charging? Yet, do people want that? Is that a real uh, important Some feature? Do. I use it. I use it for Some like. It, do. I wish it were faster. I wish it were faster, right? Yeah. Like I have a pad on my desk at work that I drop my AirPod case and my phone on. Um, if it were faster, I would I would probably use it more. And I would say this, like I don't drive, but I could imagine that if you are in a car and you have, you know, like a Qi charger, you know, mount thing, like I know Mophie makes them, that would be really useful, right? To be able to kind of wirelessly charge your phone while um, it, it, it's in the car without having to have yet another kind of plug hanging out. But um, for, for me, it's the, the slowdown that's, that's the issue. But I see people using it all the time. I just I just often forget that I even have it. Like I said, I've got the pad. Um, I do it for overnight. So I have yeah. a I have a charger next to my bed, and that's a that seems to me like the place people would use it most often. Yeah. yeah. See, and I have a char my my charger next to my bed. I guess it's got the thing where um, it has the place where I can put my um uh it's one of those twelve south chargers, and it right. has like a place to watch the watch and, and the I AirPods and exactly. the phone. Yeah. And so, yeah, so I just kind of plug everything in. But um, at, at work, I I finally found a use for that Qi charger. Once I got the AirPods with the wireless charging case, I was like, oh, that's useful. Get I this. Can just drop my Get AirPods. this. This is uh, my Surface uh, Studio replacement. It's a Lenovo Yoga. It yeah. has a Qi charger right here. See, that's mm. is that's that wild? Yeah. It's actually that's on wild. the base of the computer, so I can charge my that's have my phone wild. charge while it's sitting there. Is that wild? See, that is brilliant. That well done, Lenovo, because that's actually really smart. And um, there are a number of uh, like a uh, couch companies now that are putting like USB um, plugs into their sofas. IKEA, which I, IKEA yeah, is IKEA. putting it into all their tables, which yeah. I love. But but I'm hoping maybe the next thing will be like Qi chargers too. You know. Okay. So I guess mm. I guess we are saying wireless. Greg was right. Wireless is the next big thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, the, what I, I didn't say that it wasn't there. What I was saying was that I want to see more progress around that front. I think that we've had a good first effort, and I'd like to see more wireless. And instead of having to pay a hundred dollar, hundred pound premium for AirPods that support wireless charging, it should be the default. Should it shouldn't everything. cost a million dollars. I'm sure that's, right? that's what's going to. Yeah, happen. and and then as Christina says, it should. Can we get faster wireless? Now I know there's perfectly practical technology reasons as to why there's not, but. You know, I'd like to see that happen. I also wonder if um, Apple will start to focus more on fitness. Um, people are very much in love with these rings that monitor sleep and heart rate. Yep, yep. And I think that's a that natural cool. market for Apple to be in. They should maybe, I, that would be interesting, wouldn't it? Yeah. I mm -hmm. actually had an instance this week where my Apple Watch really helped me because my um, my heart rate was elevated. And it was like, my resting heart rate was like 165. Yikes. Um, yeah, no, so I had to go to the ER and I have an appointment with a cardiologist on Tuesday. You know, I saw and, your and I, tweet. I meant to ask you, are you okay? Yeah, I think so. I think that I might've been dehydrated. I'm, I'm getting some stuff checked out, but it was 
having the watch was amazing for a couple of reasons. A, I was able to run the, the, the EKG, which even though it didn't detect anything, it showed the sinus rhythm. And so the, the doctor was able to look at it, but B, it, you know, had, um, the whole history of like, cause I, I started to feel it higher in my resting heart rate when it was like 115, 120, I was a little concerned. Jeez. And then it started getting higher than that. Did you get the warning my, from the watch? The watch said, you're not yeah. doing anything. Right. And then, and then, uh, then my arm started tingling and that's when, when we started to kind of freak out. Wow. And, uh, yeah. and so, you know, as we go to the hospital You're and whatnot, too young to have a heart attack, like, Christine. I know, I know. And I didn't have a heart attack. It wasn't that we, we were not really sure. I, I might've been some dehydration might be some anemia, who knows, but I have an appointment on Tuesday. Good. It's going to be fine. But having all that data there. If I had so known this, I would not have booked Greg Farrow on the show. I apologize. <laughs> We're going to kill Christina. No, 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 I'm fine. No, We're having fun. You're We're gonna having give fun. her a heart attack, Greg. You, you told me you're, you're, we, we wanted to have a show, so she's like gonna, you know, she's gonna great. pass out. It's, it's, it's fun. <laughs> We're having fun here. This is fun. <laughs> but genuinely, you know, um, it's probably a bad thing for certain hypochondriacs to have access to all your health information yeah, that way. Yeah. Uh, but for me, it was really beneficial, and I wasn't. It wasn't one of those things where I was mm. even. Like it was funny when it got super high and we went to the, the hospital and we were telling them, they were like, were, were you freaking out when it was this high? And and I looked at my husband, he was like, no, she wasn't really. I was like, no, I was, I was the calm one. He was the one who was freaking <laughs> out. But having, you know, the history of all that stuff to show, I think is, okay. is so important. And even the doctor was talking about how great it was that yeah. people come in now Just with that this information. information. More yeah. is better, yeah. right? Even if it's not medical Look, grade or whatever, it's still useful. Yeah, yeah. Right. I mean, and it gives e you something. Even though it's not calibrated or medically, right. it's it's like no, not permissible in a court of law. It's not necessarily right, right. But, medical but it's grade, but it's, they can use that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's better. I have a baseline. I can show this was Chris the history. This is what my heart rate was doing from this period to this period. Do me a favor, Christina, yeah. though. If your watch says anything's going on, let me know. We've got Aunt Pruitt in the wings. We could swap out Aunt Pruitt. It's very calm, <laughs> relaxed, <laughs> soothing. And, uh, and and we could save Greg for somebody we want to wake up. <laughs> no, I'm just I'm kidding. Fine, I'm, I'm just kidding. She'll be fine. Let's take a break because actually I kind of buried maybe the most important story, Apple story of all. Apple is changing its right to repair stance. This is dramatic. And we'll talk about that in just a little bit. But first, a word from our sponsors. Give you all a chance. Let your heart rate go down. <laughs> Calm down with the blood pressure. Do you ever have pa panic attacks, Christina? Because that sounds like it could have been a panic attack. Yeah, but attack. it wasn't that. It was literally like I was getting out of the shower and I, I felt it and I put my watch on. And I looked and I was like, mm. Yikes. And then when it started going higher when I was sitting down, I was like, uh. Yeah. So I texted my my boss. I had a meeting. I was like. We I'm saw the tweet. We saw the tweet. Yeah, I sent we the thought, tweet after. Oh, no. I, I, yeah. I sent the tweet after I, I was fine. Yeah. But because I wanted to like let people know you know, uh, yeah. the watch is good. Yeah. Basically. It's pretty amazing. You're not the first person who's told me stories like that. I, the other day <laughs> I was, I was, uh, I was doing, uh, uh, this kind of weird push up you do with, with, uh, uh, dumbbells. What do you call those? There's a name for them. And uh, I put the dumbbell down too hard, and my watch said, "Did you fall? Are you okay? Is everything all right? Yeah, Are you yeah, dead?" I love that. I love that. <laughs> and then, but that wasn't that was okay. I understood that. But then I was dancing, and it did the same thing. I thought, "Oh, this is not good." Funnily this, enough, my, when I was hit by the car, watch said nothing. Nothing. Although that might have been before the update of the software for that stuff, yeah. I don't know. But when I was hit by when I was hit by the car, the watch was like it was, it was, it was cool. Like, so the, she the just, watch the, the watch the, wasn't like. <laughs> is this the bus? The one you got hit by yeah. the bus? Okay. Well, it was it was hit by the car thrown under the bus. Yeah. <laughs> and the watch, the watch goes. Ah, she's fine. Basically, <laughs> you got an appointment in ten minutes, Christine. Yeah, yeah. you're fine. Leo's dancing and the watch goes off, but you get thrown under bus and yeah. you die. Mm. Yeah, there's some uh, calibration. My <laughs> dancing though is much like being thrown under bus. Greg. I just want to much understand. Our show today brought to you by Captera. Captera is saving people's jobs. As we speak, because this happens. And, of course, it's going to happen on the Friday before Labor Day weekend. Smithers, I want you to research all the possible veterinary office applications and give me the five top candidates on Tuesday. Now, if you're Smithers, what are you going to do? You're going to Google it? No, you're going to get just a dump of data that's useless. Are you going to call Leo and ask him? I don't know. No, you're going to go, at least now you will, to Captera. Captera is the leading 
online resource to help you find the best software for your business. The 700 categories, all the big ones, CRM, e-commerce, project management, email marketing, but also line of business software for every crazy little business. It's, it's amazing. Museum software. Do you got a museum? You need software. Software makes every business better, a more effective, efficient version of itself. And I know so many of you, and do this for Microsoft. Don't do it for me. Do it for Microsoft. They don't want you running Windows 311. They don't want you using Internet Explorer 5, but that software requires it, right? Now there's modern software you can use that, that's just going to make it so much easier. Find the software you're looking for. Go see what Carson's done. He's picked, there's already a bunch of those. He narrowed it down. And he picked the four he's most interested in. He's got a comparison chart. But here's the best part. Captera has real reviews from real users. Lots of them. A million of them. That makes finding the right software for your business a breeze. Captera.com slash twit. Every one of those reviews is a verified user of that software. Captera screens it very carefully. There's a thousand new reviews every day because millions of people use Captera every month. And in fact, it's completely free. You pay nothing for this service. So, you know, if you want to give back, if you say, well, I want to give you something, leave a review, leave a thoughtful review for the next person. That's what makes Captera amazing. It's a, it's a really great idea. Captera knows software makes the world a better place. Software can help every organization become a better version of itself. You need the best software. You need Captera. And it's free, 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 free. There's no charge ever. Captera.com slash twit. Captera.com slash twit. They've even got the big book of free software, free. Captera.com slash twit. Find the tools to make an informed decision for your business. C A P T E double -R, R A. Captera is software selection simplified. Captera.com slash twit. We thank him so much for uh, making twit possible. And we thank you for using that address and letting him know you heard it here. August 29th, two days ago, Apple announced that they are going to allow independent repair providers access to genuine parts and Apple manuals. This is something Apple fought tooth and nail. Many That's states, great. almost 30 states now, have right to repair software in the legislature. And Apple's been going to legislature to legislatures to stop it. But I, I, somebody, somebody sat up and said, no, wait a minute, that's not us. That's not us. Jeff Williams, COO, says to better meet our customers' needs, we're making it easier for independent providers across the U.S. to tap into the same resources as our Apple authorized service provider network. When a repair is needed, a customer should have the confidence repairs done right. This is huge because it's the opposite direction Apple's been going in for years. Christina, are you shocked? I'm shocked. I'm shocked. I'm so happy to see this. I'm so happy to see this. Um, a million, jillion years ago when I was uh, in college, I was a, a, a tech repair, PC repair person at Best Buy, and I was certified to work on Apple stuff. And this is before we sold a lot of Apple stuff. This is when they were still uh, the, the the power PC stuff, you know, the G3s and the G4s and whatnot. And um, the the process of getting certified uh, to be an Apple repair person, because this is when they only had a handful of Apple stores, was arduous and was was complex. And remember having to, you know, study this exam and go through all these other things. And so the fact that they're, A, making this, you know, no charge to join and that you just have to be certified, that they're going to be offering the manuals and the, and the, the parts is massive because the problem has been, um, regardless of your opinion on on right to repair and and some of the things that that might be asked and 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 some of that legislation or by some of the uh, you know companies that are lobbying for that, which which I can kind of see the other side of and say, you know, this isn't necessarily fair. You talk about you know a user base of of what like for iPhone alone is but like 1.4 billion people for for iOS devices. You're talking about people who don't all have access to go to 
Apple stores or to existing authorized repair places. And so you wind up getting shoddy battery repairs or shoddy screen repairs or other issues. And as we've seen with, you know, like the the, the uh, recall on the, uh, the 2015 15 inch MacBook, this can have major repercussions if you need to get something, you know, switched out and you don't have a place to go. So I think this is this is great. Um, I'm shocked to see it, but I'm, I'm very, very happy to see this. And I hope that this means that, um, you know, this that I hope this will make it easier for people both to get legitimate parts and offer quality repairs. I think the the challenge is going to be now, um, how do you make sure that where you're going is going to be giving you, you know, like good qualified service? You know what I'm saying? And like so, that. Well, that go to an Apple certified technician, I guess. And Apple is, as you mentioned, they're offering that certification for free. Right, right. And I guess it's now it's just, it just becomes a, a consumer uh, kind of education part where you want to say, look, right. we have all these these certified places, but you need to go to a, to a certified place and not just, you know, the, the, uh, the, the you know, shop, the, the, the phone repair shop, you know, on the corner mm -hmm. in the strip mall um, where, where the guy comes out, you know, or, or girl comes out the back with, you know, um, an iFixit toolkit and some battery they got from <laughs> Amazon, you know. <laughs> That's not a good idea. By the way, we should mention. I think it's going to be. If you I, want I in warranty the, repairs, you'll go to an Apple authorized repair person. If you're doing it out of warranty, and that's the thing is, if it's out of warranty, you want to, you don't want to spend a lot of money on repairs. That's who this is for. This independent repair provider. Yeah, well, but in, I think but there's a few. It, I think everything Christine said is quite accurate and correct. I think it's good that we have more choices about where we get our plate. Uh, equipment repaired because Apple stores are not conveniently located to everybody. They're often in arcane places like town centers, which are hard to get to if you happen to live rurally or whatever like that. So having, being able to get to alternative supplies. What concerns me is that part of the reason that Apple um, stopped letting other people do the repairs was because of repair fraud. So in China particularly, there was companies, what they would do is buy iPhones, open them up, put cheap copies of the of the parts back inside and then send them back to Apple as faulty phones, Apple would replace them under warranty yep. and then they'd sell those parts as genuine, right? Mm -hmm. So there was that. And apparently- Well, this is a good way to like address that. it, which is to give you an opportunity to buy genuine parts, yes. which you didn't have. Exactly, right? So there's, there, there, is, a, there is a risk that you'll have um, fraudulent repairs going on. And the way that Apple's done it at the moment is if you take it in, to Apple, then the fra the repairs will always be of a known quantity. Yes, they're expensive. No, you don't have any choice, but you know exactly what you're getting. This opens them up for the risk of repair fraud where people use non-genuine parts to repair phones and blah, blah, blah. Now, the second part about this is also supply chain integrity, which is a lot of these modern phones are yeah. moving into uh, secure enclaves and mm -hmm. chips that have security technologies like, for example, when you the, the chip that does your thumbprint is completely exactly. isolated from the phone. And when you change that, you actually have to have a piece of software so that you can update mm -hmm. the crypto key on board and link it with the uh, secure enclave that's on the motherboard of the phone and so on and so forth. So part of what Apple's doing here is actually taking the software that enables those parts to work together. So when you replace the board inside of an iPhone and match it with a screen, there's actually a security handshake between the two. You can't put a third party element in there. And the reason for that is because everything that's in there is in theory hackable, like we've seen right. with the baseboards and, 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 and the BMCs and, that, and, that, and the BIOSes. And, and we, we actually, you know, they, they had a, a, an issue with that, I guess it was three years ago when they started having kind of faulty repairs with the, the thumbprint sensor, where if you, because uh, a lot of times what would happen is exactly what you said, is that if you, the secure enclave between um, the, the, the home button and the screen are linked. And so a lot of times what would happen is that repair places that were not genuine would replace the screen, but keep the, uh, the button the same so they wouldn't have to go through that handshake again. But if they did something else, it might work at first. And then there was a, a an operating system update that broke those devices and gave like a, 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 a certain error code. And um, there was about a bunch of pushback on that. And Apple eventually issued a software update that overcame mm. that. Um, but yeah, I mean, that it, this has been something they've been grappling with, where obviously they had these you know, secure enclave parts of the devices that they want to protect that are very important to kind of the integrity of the phone. But you've been in this catch-22 where you either have access to the official parts or you don't. Uh, I, I mm. still think the biggest issue comes down to a lot of it, consumer education. Um, and 
I mean, I agree with you. They do are they're going to be running the risk of, of having some like, rep, uh, you know, uh, uh, fraud in, in terms of uh, repair and, and parts and that sort of thing. But hopefully this could be the sort of thing, at least my hope is that if you have more places that are authorized and that can buy the authorized parts, then um, you limit, I guess, the a the the likelihood of people having bad repairs, which does actually become yes. a hazard, not just for individuals, but for everybody around them, um, but also, mm -hmm. you know, making situations uh, like replacing, you know, the the, the fingerprint yeah. reader or something else. Not so my, my point is that there's two sides to this argument. There is the right of people to repair the systems and to make them good. But the other side is Apple has demonstrated commitment to protecting their brand. And part of that is to make sure that the parts that are in the gear are secure and safe and haven't been compromised, um, which is something that we've seen in the Android land where people take phones in and they come back yep. riddled with malware, right? So yeah, no, and, just be aware yeah. that opening up the repairs opens you up to a security risk, albeit uh, and this is why Apple is keeping it very closed. Approved repair centers, people will be issued with software. That software will have to have a supply chain because if those people plug it in and that secure enclave gets linked to that motherboard, then that has to be – this is not – just let them buy parts and fix it. It's a little bit more complicated, I think, than most people would think until you start to understand some of the pieces. That's what I was trying to highlight with my points. Well, those pieces may cost 15% more as of midnight today. The U.S. <laughs> tariffs uh, have gone into effect uh, September 1st. They don't, they're, they've been deferred to December 15th for laptops and phones because the Trump administration doesn't want to, quote, hurt the holiday buying season. But they are already in effect now for uh, parts, other parts that come from China, including this will affect Apple AirPods, Apple Watches, headphones, mm -hmm. some iMacs, the HomePod, um, and parts, the kinds of parts you get to repair these devices. Um, those are all going to be affected. And it's not just Apple, of course. It's uh, any company that imports uh, parts or products from China. 15% now, uh, December 15th, I think it goes to 25%. So. Mm. Hmm. I think it's, I think this is going to be interesting. What we're seeing in enterprise IT um, is all of the major IT companies are shifting their, uh, they call it production to Vietnam yep. or yeah, to Indonesia. Going to Vietnam. That's exactly what China, I mean, Apple's doing. Yeah. Yeah, what they're, not doing, they're not bringing them home it. to the United States. No. Well, because. <laughs> it's another country. The well, problem is tariffs can is chase you actually, everywhere. They can go anywhere you want. So, so what they're not actually doing is they're not actually producing them. They're not actually setting up factories. They're doing the final assembly phase. So the the, right. the yeah. actual parts and everything are still being made. So it goes back to, I don't know if you remember the trade wars of the 1970s and 1980s, but there was all these ways of saying, you know, we had import tariffs on things and all this sort of stuff. And then it, people would ship the prepped, unpacked, like the unassembled, and it would go to somewhere and then well, it would be assembled. There's always ways to game this stuff. Oh, yeah. And, that, and, and that, I mean, Apple's, Apple's a great example of this. Like even before this trade war stuff, exactly what, what Greg is talking about. Like they've had this process set up for years now. Uh, and this is, you know, part of, of Tim Cook and now Jeff Williams's brilliance where, you know, they, they have all the parts kind of brought into where they need to to be brought in, they're assembled in a certain area where it's kind of like this almost like tax-free kind of jurisdiction place where they do the assembly and then they ship it out from another place. You know, it's it's just a, a you know a maze of loopholes to to make things as as cost efficient as possible. And so, yeah, exactly. It's not as if the stuff's not still going to be made in in China. It's just going to be assembled in Vietnam, similar to to kind of. Um, India has been a little bit different, but that was one of kind of the the first ways people were trying to get around some of the various Indian tariffs, which was, okay, we will do everything but the final assembly in India and and be able to, you know, say that this was a made in India phone. India has made some other provisions that make that more difficult. But yeah, I mean, this is what's going to happen is China is still going to be the hub, but they just, you know, assemble in Indonesia. Well, or so the it, question it, is whether um, prices for these products know. will go up. And I think in the case- oh, yeah. Of Apple, Ming-Chi Kuo's predicting, and I think he's probably accurate, that at least initially Apple will absorb the cost. At There's enough margin in their products, and the, think, and the products are so highly priced. I think that's a reflection of the... That's a reflection of the political environment, which is unpredictable. We don't know if the tariffs are going to come in or come off. 
uh, the right. way that the current U.S. government is negotiating is it says something and then it unsays it and then it comes mm -hmm. back again and is using that as a negotiating tactic. I'm not going to comment on the politics. I'm just saying this is where the situation is. Um, I think the challenge here too is also that a lot of these companies set up supply chains that are running just in time. Uh, yep. The car factories, for example, in the UK, they carry four hours worth of stock. And they literally have this consistent delivery cycle. And the factories in that are working in China have the same thing. So now if you're going to pick up the goods and then transship them from China to Vietnam for assembly to get to the US market, what you have is a much more complex supply chain and your ability yep. to react to your orders. Um, it matters less for Apple, which is usually shipping in such volumes and has the money to have very strong discipline around the supply chain. But in terms of enterprise IT, where we're buying small numbers of high value goods, which is where I operate, the risks are that you suddenly have a situation where the American market has products that are 15% more expensive and the supply chain is messy. Things aren't in stock or modules aren't in stock um, for short periods of time because they have to go through Vietnam to avoid the taxes or whatever. And or you have some things which have extra costs out of balance with the other thing. So you buy a module that's not got the, the tariff on it. Uh, and then over here in Europe, we have a different situation where, uh, we, you know, we pay VAT, but we don't pay the tariffs and there's going to be an imbalance. And the, the market's going to shift. You might see uh, something that used to happen a lot when I was a young IT person where uh, we would buy stuff in one company, you know, in our US operation and then get them to freight it out to us in Australia to bypass the taxes, the tariffs. Yeah. So yeah. it is an it, interesting it, impact. It's going to mess up the way that we buy goods from the consumer market and also in the business market. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, it, it opens up some really interesting things. You make great points about what will happen in enterprise IT. I mm -hmm. think in the consumer space, I think at least in the short term, I don't see prices going up, but it really depends on how long this this goes yeah. on, right? Because historically, I know that Apple has actually, both when there have been UK things and, uh, you know, v various, you know, like 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 taxes, tariffs, and, and, and other VAT concerns also in um, uh, Australia, and, and based on varying prices of the dollar, where they've had higher prices there because of that. So if you were to do like even just like the, uh, you know, um, uh, just the, the currency mm -hmm. conversion, the prices would still be on average higher. And a lot of people in those countries would complain and you would see a lot of people, like a lot of my, my, my UK friends would come to the US to buy their Apple products and then, you know, smuggle <laughs> yeah. them, uh, you know, through, through, through the airport and whatnot. Um, I could see... It, it becomes a difficult political position for Apple, but but I could see, you know, but it becomes one of those places where if this becomes like, if if the administration is insistent on continuing this sort of trade war and going back and forth and making, you know, blunderous decisions, and, and if these prices are, if these tariffs are sustained, companies like Apple could be considering and saying, okay, well, we're going to have to raise our prices in the U.S. And that makes mm. a certain political they statement too, right? I think they won't. I mean, I don't. They won't change prices between now and Christmas into the holiday season no, because no, people are. I'm not, I agree with you. But what in I'm January, saying is if it goes, yeah. that's what I'm saying. If it goes after that, right? I'm not like obviously. I think for the next you know three or four months, it, no. But I'm saying if this were to yeah. continue afterwards, then I could see a realignment, and then you could almost you you could see kind of the almost a political push to say, well, we have to raise prices because this, 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 and this, um, because yeah. that has been something they, you know, tried to do um, in, in other countries before. And in this case, if enough big, uh, you know, um, uh, consumer brands uh, values together against yeah. that, that would be, that would be a powerful kind of statement, I guess. I, to, I've to got an interesting statement. question for you. What, what, what's he going to do with the $250 billion in tariffs that he collects? Give it to the soybean <laughs> farmers. Mm. Yeah. Just, I, I mean, you could build a wall. You've got to remember it, that guess. a tariff is a tax. Yeah. It's a tax, but, 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 and it goes to the government the coffers. Wall. I do wonder. You know, you're facing an election season uh, here. You know, the government is going to have somewhere between 100 and 250 billion extra dollars in revenue. Uh, that isn't a tax nominally, but it is a tariff, and you know, whatever it does seem. Uh, it strikes me that this is something that could be used um, for various purposes. I've just never seen anybody ask that question, and I. Uh, uh, I, I don't know. Tonight. I mean, apparently Mar-a-Lago has bed bugs. Maybe they could get an extra <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> oh, please. <laughs> now, let's move on because uh, it is often presumed that the iPhone is somehow magically more secure than Android devices. Uh, and maybe it is, but Project Zero at Google discovered a very interesting iOS exploit chain. Five separate, complete and unique iPhone exploits 
covering every version of iOS from 10 to 12, the most recent version. And these chains, they discovered, were being used by websites to hijack iPhones in drive-bys. So, the, and then there's some question about what these websites, but according to uh, the Google Project Zero blog, they, they discovered sites that have been using these chains for years to hack iPhones as they drive by. Uh, a little bit later, the next day, uh, TechCrunch had this story. Sources say China used those iPhone hacks to target Ouija Muslims. And that's an interesting use of this. It was a state-based attack. I don't know how many Ouija's are using iPhones. And this was the same group that they were forcing when they were coming through the borders to install Android that's software right. that they could spy on them, right? That's uh, right. Just that's the sure same thing. Anybody who was going into China in that area of China was compelled to install spyware on their phones. Um, I think this is, uh, you know, an example of how these exploits are used. I presume that Apple will button them up uh, as soon as possible. The yeah, they already. have already. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm assuming that if, if that if they've been, you know, like ex, you know, disclosed that they've already been patched. But that's it's still yeah. really interesting. Project Zero announced it after taking it to Apple. It's, yeah, uh, it's, they, they it's did not. A, they did not release the disclosure. websites used in the attacks, so there's really no way of knowing who was doing this. But the researchers said the attacks were indiscriminate watering hole attacks. In other words, not targeted. But TechCrunch uh, says they have evidence otherwise. One of the sources told TechCrunch the websites infected non Ouijers who inadvertently accessed those domains, prompting the FBI to alert Google to ask for the site to be removed from its index to prevent infections. So um, some leak uh, on this. Um, I, 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 you know, it's a fairly sophisticated attack. It requires chain, daisy chaining a variety of exploits one after the other. Mm. I think I think the I sorry, think the interesting part that the thing that struck me about this is although it's fairly shocking to find a series like there's a half a dozen zero day vulnerabilities attached here is that it must not have been widely um propagated or impacted people or it would have come to light sooner so they must have kept it very much on the quiet and even though it was a watering hole they must not have widely spread it if that makes sense because if it um People would have seen it if it had have gotten into the what into right. a mass outbreak. It kind of lends uh, credence to the thought that it's probably not a watering hole attack, but a targeted. Yeah, I well, was going to say. At, go on. Go, go ahead. Go ahead, Craig, <laughs> I, and I then Christina. Yeah. A watering hole attack is that the website is there and people would come to it. The point is that you have to generate – people have to know about the watering hole to hit right, it. Right. And these are semi-random webs. The, the hinted in the Google blog post is these are not websites that you and I would go to. You would have to have a specific reason for going to them. So in the sense that it's a watering hole attack in that it's just a, an open website, but you still got to get people to come to the watering hole. They have to know the sure. watering hole is there. So in fact, in it, the zero it, day – More uh, likely a honeypot. Right, than a, honeypot than a more than a watering hole. hole. The mm -hmm. Project Zero blog does imply that. They say real users make risk decisions based on the public perception of the security of these devices. And there's definitely a widespread perception that Apple yes. devices are somehow magically more secure. Uh, even Phil Zimmerman, the creator of PGP, says, I can't use an Android device. It's not safe. That's why I use an iPhone. But Google yeah. points out the reality remains. Security protections will never eliminate the risk of attack and this is the important part, if you're being targeted. To be right. targeted might simply mean being born in a certain geographic region or being mm -hmm. part of a certain ethnic group. All that well, users can do is be conscious of the fact that mass exploitation still exists and behave accordingly. Treating their mobile devices as both integral to their modern lives, yet also as devices which, when compromised, can upload their every action into a database to be potentially used against them. Those are kind of chilling words. Go ahead, Christina. <laughs> no, what I was going to say is what's so interesting to this to me is when you look at these various chains and you see the OS versions and you see like what models are impacted, like it really does kind of like the, the, the time period, the vector where it is potentially available um, gets shorter and shorter. So by the time you get to chain five, for instance, you have a, a fairly limited window, um, but it's still, you know, you're not talking about 
like the old model phones, right? Which is typically what we see in, in even these targeted attacks where, where what we've, you know, kind of told people, and obviously if, if you're being, if you are being targeted for a reason, it's a little bit different ball game, but the general advice we give to people, regardless of what mobile operating system you use is to, to get the latest updates. And, and Apple users tend to be better than most, you know, updating their, their software and, right. and getting the latest versions more quickly. But what's, what's really kind of, I guess, scary to me about this is you look at this and you see how quickly they're able to get these other chains up um, to you know, impact the other devices that are that are on the market, um, so that they can continue um, to do those exploits. Uh, it's also interesting because you know the the iOS the jailbreaking community has basically um, uh, died. Uh, down because it's been really hard to kind of exploit things with the exception of China, like where all the active kind of activity and jailbreaking still remains is in China. And that I don't think is a coincidence. And I think that obviously you have two different sides there. You have some people who are enthusiasts and are trying to do things for their own purposes and maybe, you know, creating malware for other purposes. But then you do also have, I think the idea that maybe you have state sponsored or targeted, you know, attacks that might be done that might be um, not as widespread as, as we see here in the Western world, um, because they're, uh, that's, that's just where a, a lot of that, uh, you know, kind of reverse engineering is really become um, concentrated at this yeah. point, which is There's a big financial effort, very financial effort in China. People find paying $5, $10, $20 US dollars for an app very difficult. And yep. so there's a substantial effort over there to break apps or to sideload apps onto mm -hmm. your phone so that you don't have to pay for them. And yes, um, so there is also just a straight out cultural issue where in a, in a country right. where, you know, 20 US dollars is a substantial amount of money, side jacking or side loading or hacking your iPhone or breaking your iPhone is highly desirable. Well, the good news is Apple uh, was uh, made aware of these uh, problems. Uh, Google says we reported these issues to Apple with a seven-day deadline. Usually there's a 90-day deadline. A seven-day deadline uh, the first day of February, which is why you may have noticed an out-of-band iPhone patch on February 7th. That was 12.1.4. Uh, and uh, so the good news is, yes, as you pointed out, these have been patched. The bad news is that they existed for years. Yes, but again, if they had have existed for years, we would have seen, and they were being exploited widely. Right. We would have seen that. Right. And or somebody would have. The general, the, the reasonable assumption is we would have noticed, and well, it would have been discovered. That's not to say that nobody got infected or that people were not, no one got compromised. It's just to say it's not a massive risk. I suspect. I mean, it's probably you're probably right in saying that it's not a massive risk. I do think, though, that it's something that we should be considering, not just uh, uh, you know looking at China, but looking at other nations, um, including the United States, where you know it is very common where you will have um, uh, security organizations, things like the CIA, who will hoard zero days and will have. Um, vulnerabilities that they might have access to for years to to access things. And just because we don't see widespread mm. uses of it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. So um, to, to me, you know, looking at this and seeing that this exists makes me think there are probably more of these things out there, not just for iPhone, but for other um, very popular devices as well that we don't know about because by design they are being um, hoarded and they're probably hoarded being by, used by nation states. Yes. And in this case, uh, it looks like maybe by China to target yeah. uh, Uyghur, Uyghur Muslims in China. I mean, in, in, during the Apple versus I, FBI case, the, the CIA, I mean, it was it was it was said in, in testimony by by people that, you know, the, uh, they store uh, zero the days. Yes, precisely. And and that, you know, because one of the big questions was, why can't you do this? And one of the, the arguments from many of the experts was, well, hey, you know, ask the CIA. They have access to a lot right. of this stuff. So in and a way, this is interesting because, yes, it, it was it sounds like it was, in fact, a targeted attack, but mm -hmm. it could have been a watering hole attack uh, had had the this government decided to use it that way. But as is often the case with well, we governments, don't have the information. they keep it secret so that they can use it in targeted right important yeah. sur surgical you, ways one of the interesting things is um there's websites out there like virus total which cat you know where you they have a, a list of known malware or known right. attacks and what's happening now is the government you know the uk government the european governments and the us governments once they know that the 
cyber weapons, if you want to go with the terminology, has been compromised or they know that their opponent has a particular weapon, they'll upload it to virus total so that the right. the weapon is dead, right? Yep. So once it's exposed mm -hmm. and everybody right. knows about it. So we are seeing a much more mature attitude. Once upon a time, they would never have released it until somebody in the community found it and then it would have been burned. Now what they're saying is, well, if our opponents have it, we might as well burn it. So nobody has it. So there, there is a very much a – that whole security industry is very difficult to discuss because it's very nuanced. Attribution is very difficult because you don't actually know. Like, for example, because Google hasn't given us the websites, we can't draw conclusions right. that they as watering holes. Are they watering holes or are they honeypots? Because if we could see that they were specifically targeted with content for a particular audience, you asserted that that might have been the Uyghurs in China. It could be, you know, they could be using the same thing for people in Hong Kong for what we know. Mm -hmm. It could have been whoever. It could have been the Russians targeting people in Eastern Europe and in, in Ukraine. There's an undeclared war going on in Eastern Ukraine still. So until we know those sites, you can't state with any certainty that a watering hole attack or a honey pile attack. Quite, but quite honestly, when it comes to security, I'm much more worried about conflict conferences and uh, where see, people go who have measles. Did you see that? The, have you seen that? There was yeah. an actual virus no. uh, yes. spreading through a black hat. It's oh, my a, God. Something called measles. Oh, yes. my God. <laughs> yeah. Apparently somebody attended That's black hat me. was actually that, oh. in the infectious stage. <laughs> so um, as somebody who travels a lot and somebody who uh, – I used to go to a lot of conferences and now I don't. This is one of the reasons why I've stopped because this is actually a problem. For example, uh, Auckland in New Zealand has 800 yeah. cases of measles in that town. Now, that's a, that is the capital that's of New Zealand, but New Zealand only has a population of 3 million. They are actually say, fully stretched. Say, that's not that, oh, my God, 800 cases. Like, vaccinate. It's, ugh. <laughs> uh, this is so, so frustrating. If, uh, we don't know if the... Uh, uh, the vector, the patient zero, the measles carrier was there for Black Hat, but it happened during Black Hat. And in particularly two restaurants inside Mandalay Bay, Lupo and Oriol, if you ate there. Uh, Again, another reason not to go to Las Vegas, right? Like, seriously. Oh, God. come on. I mean, I'm come just on. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You've had your I, shots. I, I have. I have. And in fact, the shots I go don't protect to, you. When that's did you get them, though? What? They're when not going to protect them, though. If, if you they don't are protect a, you, no. If you are a U.S. adult, uh, you haven't had age, measles, uh, measles shot in years. Or beyond, yeah. who hasn't, been, has, hasn't gotten a booster since you were a child, yeah. you are not necessarily still immune. That's I know. Right. I, I remember got there my... was a big scare when I went to college, was. and they forced us all to get re immunized shots? because to get measles shots. Um, so actually, I, don't, I I had the shot, but I also had measles. So aren't I doubly protected? You're probably okay. <laughs> so I had my booster. I, like I had my booster. My I'm so old. To, we got measles like, in my day. You got it. Keep telling me. I had my needs booster. To get a booster shot. I've had she mumps, measles, in, German measles, chicken pox. I've had them all because they didn't. Yeah, I had. They didn't, I had Go ahead. I had my booster in 1995, and so according to whatever the date was, like You're mine safe. is still good. But yes, I know, but. Because I'm paranoid, when I got the yellow fever or whatever the uh, whatever the thing was, the first time I went to Brazil, I had to get some sort of shot. I went ahead and got a booster. Why not? Anyway, I was, I was, I was Why like, not? just give me everything. Why so yeah. get it yeah. all. Anyway, I just I think it's interesting because we depend in the technology industry. We like to flock to these conferences, and to instead of just like using the internet like real people. But anyway, um, I wonder if this could have just a- Just lock a yourself in a room. You need one of those bubble boy <laughs> outfits and never go out. You're safe. Well, yeah, look at this. Look at what we're doing right here. <laughs> this is this is, this is is a measles-free event. Measles-free right zone, except for those <laughs> studio audience members. Where are you guys from? <laughs> I guess it's just interesting to think about the ramifications of that if that continues you can, to get out of hand. I think you're getting agoraphobic. Come on, get out there. It's good for you. Expose <laughs> yourself to germs. That's You want a strong immune system. Yes, well, perhaps. Our show today brought to you by LastPass. Hey, October 3rd, we're going to be in Boston. Steve Gibson and I are going to do an event with LastPass's CISO uh, and the legendary Bill Cheswick, the guy who invented the firewall at Bell Labs, and it, and we're going to be talking about authentication, the problem with passwords. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, more details about that event to come. Uh, LastPass is our host, and of course, nobody knows better the problems with passwords, and LastPass is really the cure to many password problems. Someday we won't need passwords, but we live today when we do. Lots of them for lots of sites, lots of apps. And of course, the number one risk 
with passwords is reusing passwords. Actually, the, probably the number one risk is using monkey123 as your password. Mm. Then you compound it by using monkey123 on every site you visit. Now you're, re now you're really in trouble. LastPass protects people with a great password vault that's fully encrypted, only decrypted on your device. It runs everywhere you are. First thing I install when I set up a new phone, or I set up a new computer, whether I'm using Linux, Windows, or Mac, I install LastPass because all my passwords are in it. All you have to do is remember a master password. And here at uh, Twit, we use LastPass Enterprise because we know uh, people are people. They do silly things with their passwords. And in this case, our employees have passwords to the most important things in our business, our bank accounts, our websites, our databases. And, and if they're going to have access to those, I want to make sure we're giving them access in a safe, sane way. LastPass Enterprise is getting better. They just set up an expanded business lineup with some amazing features that will do something that normally in security is impossible. It'll make you more secure and your users will have more convenience. How is that possible? Well, let me explain. LastPass Enterprise is now using single sign-on for 1,200-plus SAML-integrated apps. And, and you don't have to worry about training because each has its own getting started guide, so it's very easy for your users to set it up. The nice thing about single sign-on is uh, they don't even use passwords. They just do an approval on their phone, and it's all good to go. I love this. Google and Microsoft has started using this. Now you can extend it to over 1,200 apps in, in, your, in your business. They're also doing something I really like called multi-factor authentication. It leverages biometrics like your face or fingerprint, plus contextual factors like location or IP address. It goes beyond what two-factor can do to really guarantee that the people who are using your stuff are the people you expect to be using your stuff. True authentication with LastPass MFA. They call it LastPass Identity. It combines LPE, LastPass Enterprise, with LastPass MFA. From single sign-on and password management to adaptive authentication, LastPass is great for the IT department, and it's great for users. Frictionless access all in one simple, secure solution. I put everything in LastPass, including, by the way, my social security number, my passport, when I travel, I, I you know they used to say bring a copy of your passport. I do, but it's in LastPass, so it's super safe, super secure. But I've got it wherever I go, and of course it's great for online shopping. LastPass will fill in the credit card number automatically, fill in your address book. Don't trust it to your browser; that's not secure. Trust it to LastPass. We use LastPass Enterprise at Twit. I use LastPass Families at Home. I'm very excited about the steps LastPass is taking to take us into the 21st century beyond passwords. I think you will too. From authentication to access to passwords, LastPass manages every entry point to your business so you can mitigate risk while improving employee productivity. We're big fans. I know you will be too. Learn more at lastpass.com slash twit. Lastpass.com slash twit. Maybe the single sign-on, and you know, this is so easy. I think a lot of people will be using it. It's just a great way to go. I love it. So you posted a little something. I think this is going to stimulate some conversation from the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Don't yeah. play in Google's privacy sandbox. Google has been uh, modifying Chrome significantly to make it safer, but one thing they don't want to get rid of is cookies. Mm -hmm. And um, this is kind of controversial. Cookies, especially third-party cookies, are the number one tracking uh, technology. Um, but, but Google says... Blocking third-party cookies, which every other browser does, web. will hurt we'll user privacy. Yes. It's going to break like the It'll web. be terrible because instead, yeah. you know, uh, it, actually, it's kind of a – I've got to get them credit – their rationalization is sort of brilliant. It's complete BS, in my opinion. But it's <laughs> EFF <sort of> <laughs> calls it privacy gaslighting. Oh, it is. complete <laughs> gaslighting. But I have to say, it's sort of brilliant because what they're saying is they're like – if you block these third-party trackers, which are so invasive in this and that, even more invasive trackers like fingerprinting and pixels and this and that will be used. So please, let's use this thing that we 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 know and accept is is bad, but that we can block and and not these other things that are much harder to. It could to be block. worse. <laughs> yes, this is, it, it is security gaslighting. It is it is hilarious. But I mean, I have to give them credit, like. I mean, I, I personally, as I said, my opinion only, and I'm speaking for myself, I'm not speaking for any employers or anybody else. This is just me speaking. I think it's total BS, but I also, I have to kind of applaud them and be like, you know what? I, that argument it's is, is 
absolutely brilliant. It, oh, it's, I know, it's, the lawyer that it's outright the lawyer evil. That, that is great. <laughs> it is. It is outright anti-vax. Yeah. This, this is this is literally anti-vaxxing on browsers, <laughs> taking a tiny little, fu- you know, th- claim of truth and blowing it into the entire truth and ignoring all the falsehoods around it. It's absolutely taking privacy and turning it into anti-vax and saying oh, you don't want privacy because you know blah blah blah. The good right, news um, is yeah, the interesting- you, you have a choice. I mean, there are very good. I use Firefox, uh, which not yep. only blocks third-party cookies but also attempts to block fingerprinting. I don't know how complete yep. its blocking is, but it's built in there. Uh, I always turn off the uh, trackers like the Facebook like button and the Twitter mm-hmm. sign in. Um, there's lots of things you can do to improve your privacy online. Uh, and I also understand that Google, which is the world's largest ad agency, uh, yep, doesn't want to do company. too much of it's, that. It's actually not Google in this case. It's Google's customers. customers. So people who go up to Google's uh, ad system, they use that to track you as you move around the web. Right. And if, the and the, so if you go and read the WebKit security policy or the Mozilla security policy, I'll put some links in the show notes there. They actually state quite clearly that they are going to take active steps to mm-hmm. block tracking. They are actively going after anti-tracking. They will yep. block cross-site tracking. So this idea that you go to The Verge and they lay down cookies for about 40 or 50 sites in your browser, and then you go to another one and those cookies track you as you go around the web. It's a combination of um, one pixel cookie and all this sort of stuff. We know all about that. And they ID you. And then if you suddenly go from The Verge to a store and you put something in the in the the cart, but then you walk away and go to another site, then then they contact you and say, you've left this in the cart. Why don't you come back and buy it? Or they track you <laughs> right. as you go from a review site. And those review sites live, uh, you know, live by these. Um, well, that's OK. So there right? is an issue here, which is uh, a lot of the web is monetized this way. Uh, yep. A lot of the web is free because of that. Isn't it the case well, that if we break too many of these systems that, uh, I mean, I know sites are going out of business right and left. Totally, it's free but, but, in mean, the sense that people don't know. The problem is that the ordinary human doesn't understand where the money pays for that review and they don't understand that um, – it's like when you go to a car yard, you negotiate with the car dealer to buy a car, you know where the commission is and you know where the money's coming from. When you go to a review site, ordinary people don't understand that these people are maybe making recommendations on the bunch on the back of the fact that they're getting a spiv or a kickback, right? In the 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 amount of monitoring. It's like if people knew that when you walked into Walmart and then you went around the road to the Target and then you went around the road to the next shop and the next shop and each one of those shops knew exactly where you went in each store and every item that you picked up, they would be horrified. And that's exactly what's happening on the web. And well, which, Google which saying, honestly, go ahead, Christine. Which people have tried to. Well, I was going to say what you just described was beacons, which is something that they, you know. Company, that, that in the real world, uh, Apple right. supports real, beacons. All of Apple's devices beacon, uh, which I was surprised absolutely. to learn. And, 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 and mm. iBeacon is a thing, and, and, yeah. and big stores do it. I mean, this is, they're very much, if they could do that, they they're would. They're trying to. <laughs> oh, a, there are active industries, like, you know, sub industries within, um, you know, like a retail that are dedicated strictly to that purpose. And so if they can get people to do that, they, they would. And, and I, I agree with Greg to a certain extent that people will be horrified. I I also think that it's one of those issues where we're in this place right now, which I think is really good, where people are getting freaked out about privacy for good reasons. And the pendulum has swung for 10 years or so. Everybody was was pretty willing to just be like, eh, whatever. Um, and now people are getting really freaked out about it. I do think that it's important in some cases to be um, understanding about, and I'm not saying this is what Google is doing at all, because I actually am in disagreement with, with their rationalizations, but understanding the differences between things like first-party cookies and third-party cookies. And, and I'm mm-hmm. not going to take a um, hardlining value and say that all analytics and all tracking and all telemetry is bad because I that that would make me a hypocrite. You know, my, my past life as a journalist, knowing how many people yeah, you worked at website, Mashable. Knowing, Mashable exists yeah, because it, uh, it was free. Exists, absolutely. Yeah. Well, and, mm. and advertising, you know, some of it's direct ad deals, some of it's other things, but even beyond that, like knowing what people click on, knowing what people like, knowing what content is doing what, that's valuable information. Now, I personally, even for my own personal websites, I would like to know that. I don't need to know any information about the people themselves. I don't want to have something that's linked to some profile that could be personally identifiable information, right? But it's not, 
I'm not going to make an argument that said that where I'm going to be a hypocrite and say, it's not useful for me to know what countries people visiting my website come from or what content is but most But there's a popular. difference between first party uh, analytics and third party analytics. I agree so with you. So I went I on and researched this I, a little further. And what I've uh, discovered is that there are businesses out there building business intelligence on companies by tracking their employees as they move around the web. Yes. So, yes. You, so one of the issues that I'd like to draw to people's attention is that if your company uses Chrome, you're actually giving information to your competitors about what's happening inside of your company. Yikes. Because yeah, I can target this. you and see what your purchasing art department is buying. I can go well, and monitor terrible. what your IT team is How would you get that information? Where do you get that? Do you well, buy it from uh, somebody? Yeah, you buy yeah. it from a third party. Yeah. Chrome extensions. So there was a great Ars Technica uh, in, uh, kind of co-investigation. There was um, a, a guy, he made, he kind of a, a, he was an ISP and he discovered that he was seeing weird data logs. And he did some investigations and found out that there was this third party company. They'd even been on product hunt and stuff where they were basically selling a Google Analytics dashboard where people could see their competitors and they could see like what their internal Google Analytics stuff looked like. And they were doing this because there were very popular Google Chrome extensions where people would opt in and by opting in it just means clicking whatever dialogue would come up when the extension was installed to letting any of their data go across but a lot of the information was personally identifiable they claimed that they were scrubbing that information but it wasn't yeah. um, i'm going to find the link and, and put it um yeah. in um the so, uh, irc yeah. but yeah i mean there are but like greg is saying there are our whole industries involved with selling this sort of information um that people can get either through extensions or uh, third-party trackers or other things, and I do agree with you. Greg. So you there remember the difference between... yeah, so you remember Sorry, the debt was... collection thing that happened a month or two ago, um, and they were able to find anybody anywhere. There's exactly the mm -hmm. same business as debt collectors, and except they're tracking what companies are doing and then selling that information to your competitor. So if you're a company using Chrome today, you are literally giving your competitors information on what your business is doing if you are in a business that's competitive. Well, and that is that is the that is why you should be switching to WebKit, which is Safari, Safari, Firefox, what, is, what Mozilla. Do you, what do you use uh, as a browser, Greg? Uh, I run Safari most of the day, and then I have a special Firefox um, hack, which uh, every time I shut Firefox, it wipes all the cookies, everything inside of it. So if I'm running to a site where I'm not quite safe, I fork to Firefox, fork the link to Firefox. Yeah. and that I use Firefox, I Firefox uh, Focus on my iPhone and uh, Android phone. This does that. Every time you yes. use it, it uh, you can f flush everything out, all the tracking cookies, everything yep. after you use it. I think that's a nice choice. Uh, although I am on an iPhone, so I'm using WebKit, so I feel fairly safe. But it's just nice to have that as a, a choice. Of course, on Android, yeah, just, I, I do. The, the, the switch here is that everybody but Google is switching to an anti-tracking policy. And that's why Google's doing this. So we should be very clear. They're seeing yeah. Safari and WebKit uh, move in this direction, anti-tracking technologies. Mm -hmm. Firefox does it. Brave does it. I bet you, I, I seem to remember when uh, Microsoft said we're going to start using the Chromium engine for Edge. Yep. They said, but we're going to strip out all that tracking yes. stuff, right? Yeah, I mean, to be clear, and and because it's still in betas, and, and what of the, the beta actually just came out, and I've actually been using uh, the the Chrome since it was just in Canary, and I like it a whole lot, uh, or not Chrome, uh, Edge, Edge, and I like it a whole lot, but I use uh, Safari as well, but I primarily these days use the uh, Edge browser. There is some telemetry, um, and there is some Microsoft syncing. It's not the same extent of Google stuff, but I don't know the details about how all of that works. Uh, but Here's, yes, that you know, was maybe one somebody of the can find out for us and let us know, and we can publish something on that. I think it's yeah, very no, interesting it that be good. You know, I, I Google, know that the team is committed to to trying to be to follow some of the same uh, guidelines that Mozilla and WebKit have put so out. So you but, can, according uh, to. Uh, First post, you can enable, uh, through experimental flags in the new Edge, you can enable tracking protection. And very much like Firefox, they have three choices, basic, balanced, and strict. And so it, you can turn on strict tracking protection. Sounds like it's doing very much the same thing Firefox is doing. Yeah, I think it's following the same guidelines. I think that the balanced is the default one, but, you know, those things could change by the time the final you know, version you know, comes out. I, guess, I think this make, a little bit makes sense. You can show it here, uh, Carson. I've got it on my screen. I think it kind of makes sense, which is for most people, you, you know, you don't want to break their experience of the web. If they know what they're doing, um, they can make it more strict. I certainly go into, and Firefox starts with a, a less uh, extreme, ex it's very similar to Firefox's tracking 
Um, yeah, yeah. This is this is an intent to f- to change future versions of Firefox yep. to be actively hostile. It'll move to the strict as a default, but it'll be progressive so that nothing breaks over yeah. time. Or in an attempt to manage what my, I mean, I already have a problem today with my ad blocking settings and my outbound filters and so forth. There's a lot of websites that just don't work. Well, isn't that going to be the real problem? Is that soon websites will just reject you if you do any kind of. I was going to say this, well, this becomes the thing. Although what's really interesting, and, and Greg, I'd like to know your thoughts on this. And this obviously becomes very geeky, but this is the sort of thing that could be productized very, very easily, where you see people, you know, creating like a, a Raspberry Pi holes where they're creating, you know, kind of like ad blocking, like at the DNS, at like the router level, um, which is much harder to, because yeah, you do have the issue where websites will just break if you are running, you know, tracking, um, mm-hmm. uh, if you turn off tracking or if you have ad blockers running. But if you're uh, blocking things that kind of like the, the request level, a lot of times um, it, it does, uh, things are still able to get yeah. through. So, um, It'll be interesting, I think, if if somebody if they haven't already a way to productize, you know, because it's it's a fairly simple process to set up a pie hole. Um, somebody productize. Google, so let, let me stop I you. Think and there just are say, some people doing Google's that. Google's ahead of you there. Yeah. Google's ahead of you there. They've already invented a protocol called DNS over HTTPS. It's been ratified by the IETF. It's nearly complete through the standards process, and a future version of Chrome will actually use that won't use your computer's DNS. It will actually use an internal setting to the app. And it'll make its DNS gotcha. queries directly to Google's DNS, and you will never be so pie hole will die, um, okay, and you won't so be able to filter. Well, the they'll DNS. die if you're using Chrome. I'm using Firefox, which also uses HTTPS over DNS, but uses Cloudflare's one dot one dot one dot one DNS, and I trust say, Cloudflare. I think. Yeah. yeah, I was going to say, what if you're using like a Cloudflare or what's the other one, Quad Nine? There are a couple yeah. of other like privacy focused DNS things. Um, so, I mean, I, I. I hear what you're saying but i do wonder like i think dns over https is a good thing though right on balance if you were forced to uh, use google that'd be different but because i don't use google uh i think that's a that's a good thing uh, well, it's, a, it's a balancing act here because now my eye the- it's protecting you from your isp so i've just spent five days researching dns over https and getting inside of all the issues and i've got a head full of stuff that so stop me if i get a little bit so the idea was is that um a lot most dns queries are in the clear and anybody can capture them your isp or any, yeah you know and then a lot of services actually use that metadata and sell it for money so a lot of isps force you to use their dns server right. um and then they sell the dns data and a lot of yeah. companies have since got up and said so companies like cisco bought open dns so that they can get the yep. security data so now they get the analytics data streaming off that mm-hmm. part of the reason that google created its dns and cloudflare has its dns they might say it's Why for the nine? good of the world yep. no you know but it's actually right. analytics data that drives them they get to know what's happening on the web they can so, also find malware and spyware and sites that are set up that aren't otherwise and, found. And, so there is some good but the challenge here is the, to encrypt dns we have a mo- number of things. DNSSEC won't ever get legs because it's too hard. No. Nope. Um, any form of PKI with a root to, you know, tree infrastructure means the root becomes a single point of failure um, and becomes a, a key weakness. And we keep trying to work with DNSSEC and it's just never going to go. DNS over HTTPS means that the DNS query gets embedded in HTTPS and all of a sudden the inspection engines that look for that data will stop working. Now, what I want you to think about is when something like the Facebook app on the iOS has that DNS over HTTP built in. So you never see mm-hmm. the Facebook DNS queries. That's a whole filtering mechanism that's suddenly cut off. Or people start building JavaScript apps in web pages that do DNS lookups in JavaScript so that it right. never uses your local DNS. And that's that's good in the sense that my metadata, the DNS lookup I have is no longer available to somebody in the network. But um, we're also in a situation where our my client, my DNS queries are no longer under my control and also the servers become uh, centralized. So right. Cloudflare, Google. And the so, challenge that I have is that Google and Cloudflare aren't actually good people. They're all um, what I call princes of privacy. That is, they've got their version of privacy, but they don't have a common version of privacy. Right. So we actually, you know, Matthew Prince says, I just woke up this morning and decided to kick 8chan off the internet. Well, it shouldn't be his choice. There should be some... You know, maybe that's do, a topic we can touch you, on. But anyway, I'll stop. Yeah, you, you, you want a let's encrypt of, of DNS, basically. So I want a policy you know what? that the, says... The real solution is have an ISP you trust. 
Yeah, this is true. No, there's no I mean, ISPs. I trust. No, I trust no. SonicNet. That's our ISP. I know because uh, I, I trust WaveG. I yeah. trust WaveG completely. And I know um, that SonicNet is not not harvesting or using my DNS uh, queries. Uh, yeah, same. But they're all, but they're all in clear text, right? If I'm monitoring them upstream, like the reason that Well, you don't see it upstream, started. do you? You, If I get that sa query satisfied yes. by, by SonicNet, I don't, you don't see it upstream. Only upstream resolve is also leaked data. Yeah, but if there's so no upstream the resolve, if, if it gets solved downstream, I don't go upstream, do I? Well, yeah, the cache has to be refreshed, and if it's not in the local resolver cache, it goes up to the root server. Oh, I understand. Anything tech. that goes beyond the ISP is out in the public, but... But most yes. of the time, your server, your your queries are cached, unless you're going strange places. But maybe those are the places you most want to protect yourself against. So, yeah, what, can I set up my own DNS server? Because this this is Firefox's settings. It's in the general under network mm -hmm. settings at the very bottom. I can turn on DNS over HTTPS. The default provider is Cloudflare, but I could set up a custom provider. I'd have to just know enough to set up a custom secure yes. DNS provider, or perhaps so, use a yeah, third Bind party will, that I trust. Yes, so Bind will have a, has a DNS over HTTPS or DO, DOH. We but say by DOH. the way, they're not canonical either. If if they don't have the DNS record, they're still going to send it in the clear to the canonical servers, aren't they? And they're working on that at the moment. So, so it's, not be DNS another... all, it's not HTTPS all the way. No. It's only between you and the DNS server, Same which, is, which is a start, right? It's a it's an iteration. The DNS protocol was built in a day when mass surveillance wasn't possible oh, yeah. and wasn't yeah. even imagined, right? Yeah. So the, the the situation that we live in today is very different. So you know, baby steps, baby steps. You know, if you want to go back to, you see, Microsoft never changed from where it was to say encourage people to change. Whereas the ISOC, the Internet Society and Consortium, and the the people that run the Internet Backbone are saying we need to change DNS. And there'll be another. Did I talk to you about the DNS flag day earlier this year? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's so there'll enough. be another That's one enough. next year. <laughs> There's another on one that. next year where certain <laughs> things will happen. Uh, actually, you really want your blood pressure to go up, Christina. Don't listen to this. You really okay. want your blood pressure to go up. Uh, here's a proposal, and again, it's from the Trump White House, so you never know how much of this is sincere. <sighs> but to use stuff like your Fitbit data. To predict violent behavior, yes, oh we have a God. big we have a big problem. There was yet another mass shooting last night, uh, and 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 by the way, anytime you listen to this show, that's probably going to be true. Sad to say, in this country, I'm mm -hmm. de devastated to have to say that. But there's a new proposal. The Health Advanced Research Projects Agency (HARPA) is is a new agency, proposed agency that'll be in HS, HHS. And they want, to, they want to adopt something that's got a very long acronym called SAFE HOME, Stopping Aberrant Fatal Events by Helping Overcome Mental Extremes. They presented it at the White House last week. They want to use volunteer data to uh, identify neurobehavioral signs of someone headed toward a violent explosive act. Everybody would be a volunteer. <laughs> uh, and the data... Well, it would come from your Fitbit or your other health device. That that way we, you know, everybody has to wear one because otherwise uh, the bad guys could get away with it. Uh, so I, we are, you know, I don't think this is going anywhere, obviously. It's obviously not. not. It's, this it's, violates it's, so many civil liberties things. It's a nut things. job. I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, genuinely, this is like ultimate Although, like, violation of, of, both, of both HIPAA. According to the Washington like, Post... <laughs> This is being uh, one of the proposal supporters is Bob Wright, the former NBC chair. Okay, Robert great. Wright. Like, so he's got some clout. Uh, well, yeah. So I'm just saying, a, a you can network. easily see a future where this kind of government surveillance in all different areas becomes the norm. And what it always will happen is out of fear. We got to solve this problem, and it's a terrible problem. And yep. we are all terrified that we can't walk down the street anymore without getting shot. So think everybody's got to wear a special Fitbit. Yep. You've got to think of the children. Think of the children. Think of the children. Yeah, you've got to think of the children. Uh, yeah, it would, it would totally prevent gun, <laughs> gun violence because all you need to do is, is track everyone who's going to the gun store to buy... No, no, that, we can't do that. That would be no, wrong. Can't do that. That, what? <laughs> that would be wrong. We just need to track uh, all the people. No, we track your heart rate. Guns. We can't track your uh, visits to the gun store. That would no, be wrong. No. 
Yeah. It's simple. That's how the Democrats. <laughs> that's how we get the Democrats behind this. <laughs> is tell them. We'll By the way, I love it that uh, after people. the president tweeted a surveillance image of Iran, the folks at Reddit got together <laughs> to f to figure out where it was and how it came from, came to be, and and uh, the whole genesis of it. Reddit's kind of amazing. Whether this is real or not doesn't matter. I just it's just incredible yeah. to read these Reddit threads. Apparently it is. So apparently they um it's they really a, it's, did it. They tracked they tracked the angle and it was uh tracked to a satellite, a spy satellite, which was known to be in that orbit. And then uh I watched a video from Scott Manley on YouTube who actually unpacked it all. And he was saying that the amazing thing about this is even though this is a picture of a screen. Uh, he says that uh, it looks like somebody held a smartphone up to a computer screen and took a photo of it. Yeah, because the black it. part up in the upper left where it says top secret, do not reveal to anyone <laughs> yeah, under yeah. penalty of yeah. death, that's that's kind of cut off there. So apparently this is a 10 centimeter resolution, whereas the previously what? best known spy really? satellite is 40 centimeters. Oh. Yes. Oh, so he just so, basically burned the new uh, spy satellite. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and that's why people are... Uh, that's, that's 10 centimeter is. resolution? Yes, apparently so, yeah. Holy cow. Well, um, now we know that thanks to Reddit. <laughs> <laughs> some of the Reddit. Some of the best research yeah. being done today. Done by it's anonymous. just amazing what they can calculate from a photo. They can calculate the shadow so they know the angle. And then they go the and look at where the angle it. was from. And then they go, yeah, that's a known spy satellite. It would have been in that location at that time. And Jeez Louise. Just like, yeah, just amazing, uh, amazing science going on behind that to decode it. Let's take um, a break. We're going to wrap this up. We have a great panel. I mean, uh, and it's the smallest panel we ever have, <laughs> which is three people. But... And I don't really count because it's Greg Farrow and Christina. I just, uh, you guys are fantastic. I love having you on. Greg Farrow is, of course, at the Packet Pushers Network. He's ethereal mind on the Twitter. Get in the debate there. I'm sure the debate will continue after the show on the Twitter. Uh, Christina yeah. is, of course, uh, our favorite senior cloud advocate at Microsoft, Christina Warren. She's at film underscore girl on, uh, on the Twitter. And both are dear old friends that I just love getting together. And watching the fireworks fly. Our show today brought to you by FreshBooks, the number one accounting software in the cloud. They take the stress out of it. For you, your team, they make it easy. It all starts with your invoices. You're doing billing. Do it through FreshBooks. It makes it easier. They look professional. You get paid faster because as soon as you start using FreshBooks, you can accept online payments from your clients. You can organize your expenses with the FreshBook app. It's right on your phone. You take pictures. It goes right into the invoice if you're billing for expenses. Otherwise, it goes right into your accounting, all the time tracking. You can even have different costs for the same client for different projects. And then you manage all the client information in your client hub. You could focus on building a relationship. Yeah, it's basically CRM too. View expense reports, track time, create invoices, keep your clients up to date on your progress, share important details with them. It's all in one screen, in one place. Your FreshBooks dashboard. And then there's the FreshBooks app that can up your game with access to client information no matter where you are, when it is. You can get the flexibility you need to get the job done. You can send an invoice right from your phone, check for updates, file a receipt, respond to a client ASAP. Or just get the most up-to-date information while you're standing in line for coffee. If you're a freelancer, you I know I never knew if I was making money until tax time. Now you know anytime you want because it's all there in the FreshBooks app. FreshBooks help you stay on top of your business's well-being. It's a straightforward dashboard, accurate timekeeping. You can leave the days of receipts and calculators and tedious hours of work behind. FreshBooks is amazing. I started using it years ago. I love it. It's used and trusted by small business owners all over the world, 120 countries. Customer service from nice people in Canada. That's where they're from. Via phone, email, and live chat. They're really nice. If you're looking for something that always lets you have your finger on the pulse of your business, if you want to make your life easier and still know more and be more in charge, freshbooks.com slash twit. We've got a 30-day free trial for you, but you have to say this week in tech in the How Did You Hear About Us section. Freshbooks.com slash twit. Don't forget to give This Week in Tech credit. We love you, Freshbooks. They're one of our favorite sponsors. Been with us for years. Uh, I saw Rob at... Um,
they did they sponsored a really fun ignite you know those um it's not ignite is it ignite the t the the really fast talks the short five minute talks they sponsored one of those at podcast movement it was so much fun rob was there <laughs> thank yeah. you fresh books what is, is it called ignite i feel like it is those uh I did it in a speech. Lightning once. talks or whatever. They're like I know what lightning you're talks. About. Yeah, uh, O'Reilly. Uh, it was started in Japan. O'Reilly made it popular in the U.S. You get the slides move every fifteen seconds. You can get fifteen slides or something. So the the talk is. Oh timed. yeah, yeah. It's yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, I go to one event and they have uh, everybody gets a red card, and if the person talking is boring or starts shilling for the company they work <laughs> for, they get get pulled off stage and the next person starts talking. Yeah, you get twenty, you get 20 yeah. slides, fifteen seconds a slide. Uh, IgniteTalks.io if you want to know more about it. And the thing, I have one on do on uh, podcast advertising. It's so much fun. They're all over the world. They they did one at uh, Podcast Movement. It was a lot of, a lot of fun. We've made this little mini epic movie all about the week that happened this week on Twit. Previously on Twit. I'm sure he know. felt very entitled to it. Yeah. It Even was. though he was probably being paid a butt ton of money. A butt ton? Is that our new measurement? <laughs> that's that's one of my it's favorite the measurements. More, it's, yeah. the British, it's, it's, it's 53 the Cardi B's, I believe. Triangulation. For a certain group of people, and I include myself, Randall Monroe is the geek's cartoonist. I hope that's okay to say. And XKCD at XKCD.com sure. is a must read. <laughs> This week in enterprise tech. Instead of asking on-prem, hybrid, private cloud, VMworld 2019 said yes, all of those things. All about Android. We talked to Dave Burke and Dan Sandler from the Android team. There was a rumor that Q was too hard to name, so we, we came up with numbers. But I want to point out that left to my own devices, I would have called this thing Queen Cake. People are dying to know what is going to happen to the Android statues at Mountain View. <laughs> so I'll, I'll spill the beans. We're going we're gonna to have a, a number statue. Um, it'll be fun. And then the new one is you'll be able to sign it. And so we would like to invite you guys to come along and sign it. Twit, the happiest place on earth. Did you not know that we were going to do this? I did this not the first know. time you found out? It's the first time. Sorry, we're just having a one-on-one. -on -one. That's, That's right. right. I love it. I love it. I don't know. Uh, well, we ha we don't... Oh, the hour's up. I guess you got another meeting. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got another meeting. <laughs> so what about Jack Dorsey? <laughs> <laughs> Where do you want to start oh, with that one? Oh, my God. It's not even the first time the CEO of Twitter no, has been I... hacked. No. I think, I think the amusing thing here is that, A, Twitter is still open to SMS because the the fundamental attack vector here was that they were able to, uh, the, the, the hackers got, uh, were using the SMS vector to actually send text messages from an SMS. So what they actually- By the way, without authentication, was, the only authentication right, which, is it came from your phone number. That's right. right. Which, so they which, got Jack which, Dorsey's phone number. They sim jacked him. Which is- They sim jacked yeah. him, but, but also Twitter's options. I mean, it's amazing that-, that because I have Twitter two-factor set up. Yes. And it is not through SMS. I it have to use it. No, I, no, it's a little yeah. tricky because you have to turn on SMS do, I, and then add something else and then turn off SMS. But I use right, a YubiKey. So nobody's yeah, going to nobody's gonna hack copy. my yeah. account? Jack Dorsey on, doesn't Jack. have that? <laughs> well, why would come he? On, he never Jack. uses it. <laughs> it's not like he uses Twitter or anything. He's spending most of his time meditating and fasting or something. <laughs> but, you know, whatever. Um, I think the interesting thing here is a, um, for me as a as and my focus on business and the land of corporates is that you can't trust your telcos. They're not secure. No. They're not safe. They're incompetent businesses. Don't clearly, use right? SMS for uh, for two factor. And if you do, I uh, agree. There you can uh, with some telcos like T-Mobile texted me last year saying, please put a pin on your account yeah. so that you don't well, get sim jacked. It, right. But even if you do that. Social engineering, like AT and T, a number of people have talked about that. Like, because I, I have those pin. things on my account, and then I, I, I always worry. My, okay, here's the one company I will call out as I'm so angry with them about this because it's money, and 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 I've had to turn off two factor, which I don't want to do, but oh. I don't feel comfortable having. Um, it tied to SMS. That's PayPal. PayPal yep. refuses nope. to use OTP for um, two-factor. Mm. PayPal is the they, first they, company I used a dongle with, but yep. the problem is they always have a fallback to SMS. Well, and, and whatever the now, weakest link is, that's the one 
that the and bad guys will use. And even now they've yeah. changed. From what I understand, they don't even have a dongle no, system it's anymore. SMS like they, 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 only. Right? They, they they got rid but of. But you know this. what? My bank does that. Yeah. Most banks still use SMS. Oh, yes, yes. So terrible. And you know the worst one, Verizon, of all people. They use the secret question methodology. I know. Which I, know. I don't mind if I can provide completely random answers. But no, the answers are in a drop down. Yeah. <laughs> so there is a, subs a limited set of questions and a limited set of possible answers. And it's in a freaking drop down. Yeah. Give so, me a I break. I mean, the, so, the, so the, the, the fallback from here, Leo, or my extension of that is you can criticize the methodology. But at the end of the day, you can't trust a telco. You can't trust the people who give you your mobile phone to keep that data secure. No, you can't true. trust them to operate safe and secure businesses. You can't trust them to run networks that are private and to keep your data private. You have to assume that they're incompetent and you have to take steps to cut them out of the loop. And that's something that we've been seeing proven over and over and over. So my point would be is the, the hacking of Jack Dorsey's Twitter account is partly a failure of him personally, but we as experts need to take responsibility for the incompetence of the people in our supply chain. And in this case, it's Verizon, AT&T, whoever it is, and they have proven consistently so, incompetent at securing their services. And we should take steps to get around that. It's no big deal if Twitter's Jack's account gets hacked. Big deal. No, it's not it, like he uses Do you think it. it's safe to assume the president has two-factor on his Twitter account? No, I think it's safe to say someone's monitoring it closely. Because, <laughs> I mean, a, a all he has to do, is somebody like, has to, the know. chuckle. What is it? The chuckling group that hacked Jack? <laughs> you got to figure the chuckling group is thinking if we could only get the president's tweets, we could yeah. launch an atomic war. Yeah, I mean, he had a I secret phone for a long time. He was supposed he didn't like whatever phone that they gave him, and and no, and he's using some old some Android one. four phone. That's what I'm saying. So yeah, I mean, I, I genuinely like. Obviously, there's uh, got to be a, a Secret Service guy yeah. who's watching over his shoulder. Or something. I, mean, I, mean, I, mean, I would also, be. I would bet it's oh. already been hacked. We don't. Oh, yeah. We just don't know it because he's on a seven-second delay. Oh, of course. And and there's somebody we'll at Twitter head. He's got uh, his own server at Twitter, and there's somebody at Twitter headquarters just vetting everything. Uh, no, because how do you even was, know what's real well, and what's not? It all sounds nuts. Well, but also remember when the the contractor uh, blocked, uh, like, uh, deactivated oh, yeah. his account. Yeah. So I, I I would like to think there's a seven second delay, and then they have those other things in charge. But since a contractor no was confidence. able to disable his account, yeah, no. But but if I'm also being honest, as terrible as this sounds, okay. So the the president's Twitter is is hacked. Like, what's the worst that can happen? He's already basically declared war over tweets before. He's already threatened yeah, like right. nuclear weapons. So like mm -hmm. honestly, like who cares? Like I hate to be that about it. What the else? Missiles like, are these are this is I mean, not. I'm, this I'm just saying like like the real things that he alert. does. Yeah, this is not a, the Twitter is not a system of record. It's not. It it's is not a system of record. And courts have no. held it is a system yeah, of have. record. It is. Yeah. It's legally yep. a system of it record. It can be. It and is. It, it makes. It shouldn't stop, be. It can make the stock market drop four hundred points Absolutely. in one day. It can and has. Yeah. So if you think, Greg Farrow, that the telcos are untrustworthy, what about Twitter? Well, let's not go there. <laughs> Well, in this case, I, I, mean, I, I think personally have Twitter come to a, Twitter almost user, a dead, but I've come to almost a dead stop on using Twitter because it's just a time suck and it's mental, mentally damaging. I think I think that's why industry. Christina's resting heart rate went to 136 as she was using it, it was, Twitter. I, I, could, I could certainly yeah, have that. Totally <laughs> that would do it to me. A couple of DMs from some people that are that are just not worth reading. You know, mm. yeah, it can be like that. No, I, I think the the takeaway here is the fact that you're. Telco is incompetent and should not be trusted to to handle SMS. This system that you know lets oh, you hijack a SIM or to emulate a, a you know you can get into the SS7 signaling and spoof a message and make it look like it comes from your phone has been vulnerable for twenty years and they've system, done nothing about fixing system it. System seven is it? Yeah, yeah. That's just a nightmare too. There's another. There's yep. SS7. Yep. There's another nightmare. Hey, I'm going to end on a happy note. We can't end on that note. <laughs> it's a happy note. Microsoft has told the Linux developers, we want you to build XFAT into the Linux kernel. I love this so mm -hmm. much. <laughs> to f this is XFAT, which is widely used on USB keys and stuff because it's a, a extended FAT. It works with Macs. It works with Windows. But it's always a problem on Linux. Microsoft mm -hmm. has the patent. It's Microsoft's file system. They announced today that they are supporting 
the addition of XFAT. They published the specs and they said, come on. And I think the Linux kernel developers say, yeah, we're going to put it in. Can we please have Yeah, uh, Greg Kuro Hartman has already is still started not good one. Enough. You want NTFS? XFAT is still not good enough yeah. for... You for, still have to use Fuse if you're going to want to use an NTFS. For, for thumb keys and things. You can't, you can't use large one enough... One step at a time, little you Karsten. You can't use large enough files. One step at a time. <sighs> I mean, it'd be great. Yeah, I mean, honestly, more. Uh, look, I think I, this was patent encumbered for a long time when yeah. um, Microsoft donated um, uh, patents to the OIN um, last year. A lot of people wondered about this. I think this is good. It, look, every file system could have improvements, but uh, yeah, uh, Greg Crow Hartman, who's one of the kernel gods, has already started working on a patch to get support in. I mean, I think at the very least, if you do anything, if you deal with Canon, you know, like memory cards at all, or, or things with yeah, Sony memory cards at all, yeah, th exactly. Like this is great for your interoperability, you know, with Linux. I think this is awesome. <laughs> I was very See, that's a happy note. It's a very geeky, very minor yeah. happy note. <laughs> and it is a sign that Microsoft is changing and transitioning yeah. to a modern future yeah. where it knows, you know, you don't spend $7 billion on GitHub and then say you can't have a, uh, the Good patent point. to a file Good for a file system that's Good 30 point. years old. Yeah. Yeah. See, we ended on a nice note. Everybody's making nice. Everybody <laughs> likes everybody. It's a wonderful world. We love it. We what love are you being watching here. On, what are you watching on TV these days, uh, Christina? Anything good? Well, I'm really looking forward to the final season of The Good Place coming back. Oh. Um, and I so saw we I, took I, the Universal Studios tour, and yeah. I saw where they shoot The Good Place. It's the old. Ah. It's it's it was it was called Europe because it looked like an old European town, yeah, and they remade so it, and they've got all the Good Place stuff there. And I thought this is so cool. Oh, I saw awesome. heaven. <laughs> yes. Oh, it's all the good place. Yeah, no. So um, there's always so much good stuff on, on, on Netflix and on HBO and, and whatnot. I really I liked Euphoria. I, I thought HBO. Euphoria, I was really prepared to think this is grim and depressing, and I thought that was amazing. God, it was great. Really I loved amazing. it. I loved it. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, no, you know, fall, uh, uh, traditional network fall TV season is about to start, so that's always good. Um, yeah, although it's weird, right? Because that used to be, at least for me, like one of my favorite times of the year um, because- It's changed, you know, hasn't it? September used to be and like, now, this is the big deal. Right, and now because shows launch whenever and they launch all at once, like, you know, it used to be those, the thing where I would always get the, the Entertainment Weekly and the TV Guide and I would like lay out almost like a, uh, I, would, I would get a notebook because I was a geeky child and I would like <laughs> create my own like little, Here's what I'm gonna you know, watch. <laughs> Exactly. I, I would like make lists of, hey, what shows do I think are going to last? Which ones are good? Like I would make my own like schedule of like, okay, wow, what, what am I going to watch? And, and now, you know, like it's all available everywhere, but um, still it's, it's, I still enjoy fall, fall TV season, so. so. That's so adorable. <laughs> <laughs> Do you still get TV Guide? No, I don't. No. Um, but, uh, <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I would pay, like, historically anyway, like, I doubt it's any good anymore. They, I used to love their crossword, and I used to buy yeah, the because it was the, easy. The yeah, because yeah, it was it, really it was, easy. It was. Some of them were, like, really obscure, so if you got the books. Blank's yes, I Neighborhood. Know. Some of them... <laughs> And were like really like obscure, and so I would buy, I bought like the old books, but that had like oh, the yeah. ones from like the fifties, yeah. like the seventies, eighties, and stuff. Phil and Silver's like, character. I'm, I'm like who? I'm like you know. So I now know all these weird, random old TV facts because oh, of TV funny. Guide crossword puzzles. Oh, I'm like I've never seen this show, but I know this because I've had to answer this clue that so many is times. Hysterical. That's hysterical. <laughs> How about you, Greg? What's your favorite uh, tap beer these days at your local? Ah, uh, well, I had to stop. I've been ill for a couple of months. Oh, I'm so sorry. I had to, yeah, no, not haven't been badly ill, just minorly ill. Which well, that's pretty bad if you can't have any beer. Yeah, I've been switching to gin, actually. Oh, uh, okay. UK, Never mind then. <laughs> UK has really uh, taken on gin and um, in Did a big way. And so, <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's drinking a lot of tonic. He's drinking no. tonic. <laughs> I want more queening. So I should, have, uh, I should have brought the bottle. The one I'm drinking at the moment is called Unicorn Gin. I love it. And it's, gin. Got, it's got this uh, glittery swirly. So you shake it up and it's all. Anyway, oh, that's wow. that's a joke because I have my uh, unicorn poster over there. I but, love um, gin. I shouldn't. Yeah, but I gin's a, it's just absolutely all the rage. It's basically not, it's nothing new in the nobody's... UK. I always associated gin with the UK. <laughs> but you can go to the supermarket now and there's like 80, 90 different gins just in the supermarket, wow. much less a specialist drinking wow. place, uh, which is fun. So, uh, yeah, no, I've been well, I was drinking gin for a little while and uh, I had to stop for a couple of months. I'm getting ready to start drinking again because uh, the world is getting very much like that. Where yes. drinking is definitely necessary. <laughs> Time to start <laughs> drinking. Well,
Well, I won't keep you any longer. Greg Farrow is in the UK, so it's after midnight. We appreciate your I'm being here. I'm glad you the, you've shifted the show an hour earlier. So thank you very it's much. A little for easier. That. It's much yeah, yeah, yeah. a little yeah. easier. It's only quarter to one. So we were not thinking too bad. of you when we did that. Yeah. Thank you, Greg. Thank you. Always a pleasure. Thank you, Christina. I miss yes. you. You are so wonderful. I miss you. Thank you always for for continuing to have me on. I love being on this so much. You're, um, you're the greatest. When I give a weird shout out to my shirt, I'm wearing this shirt that is a mashup of the Windows 95 and the Zelda logo. That's crazy. And, Zelda that awesome? 95. Zelda 95. That'll be in cool? sometime in the year 2228. I know. I know. <laughs> I just, I, I, I thought this was super cool. I specifically wore it for the I the saw it. I was trying to figure <laughs> it out because I saw the Windows logo. I couldn't figure out what the, what the Z was. Okay, Zelda. Love it. Thank you, Christine. <laughs> we do Twit every Sunday afternoon. Yeah, we moved it up a little bit for people like Greg. It's about 2.30 Pacific, 5.30 Eastern time. That's 21.30 UTC. If you want to watch live or listen live, we offer live streams at twit.tv slash live. If you're doing that, you really ought to be in the chat room. Old school, baby. IRC.twit.tv, although you can use your browser if you want. Uh, we also invite you to visit us in studio if you're in Northern California, the Petaluma area. We love having a studio audience. Just email tickets at twit.tv. We have a nice couple who uh, is, is actually originally from the UK. Uh, they're now living in Park City, Utah. Wonderful to have you. And, uh, and I didn't get a card for you, the guy in the back, but welcome. Where are you from? Singapore. We get people from all over the world. That's one of the things I love about uh, doing this show. Nice to have you all. Just email tickets at twit.tv so we can uh, make sure we have a place for you. Aunt Pruitt's also in the studio. Nice to have you, Aunt. He's setting up his new computer. He starts work on Tuesday. Actually, technically, we expect you to be here for Labor Day tomorrow, okay? There won't be anybody else. Just keep an eye on things. <laughs> Don't make Ant come in. He will. No, I know he would. Don't. No, no. <laughs> it's great to have you in town, finally. Thank you. Uh, thanks, everybody. If you want to watch the show on your own schedule, of course, this is a podcast. It's on demand. Just go to twit.tv, and you can get all of our shows, download them directly from the website. But you see those buttons there that say Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify, YouTube. You can also subscribe on any platform that carries podcasts and that way you'll get every episode the minute it's available. And that's probably the best way to do it. We appreciate it if you subscribe. Um, I didn't play the promo today. We'll we'll just uh, imagine, if you would, a wonderful week. And you missed a lot. We'll, so we'll, don't, we'll sneak it in. We'll, we'll sneak, sneak it in. in for the, for the oh, download. I did play it about a little earlier. I just forgot. <laughs> 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 fix it in post. Fix it, <laughs> we'll in, fix post. it in post. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. We'll see you next time. Yes. Another twit is in the can. Bye bye. <laughs>